Perhaps we need some outside universal threat to make us recognize this common bound. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. Welcome to Spaced Out Radio tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Very much appreciate you all tuning us on in as we get into the UFO world up here in the Great White North from UAP Studies Podcast. Jason Gilmet will be here momentarily. But first, we got to say hello to each and every one of you. We have Ann B in the gold medal position, race fan in the silver, to Mothman and his goatee taking home a bronze medal tonight. Hello, the lovely and talented Kira. Abbott Hoffman, how you doing? Good to see you. Robert Lamoth, Luscious Jules, Roy Boy, Dogface Simon, Brown Dwarf. Nice to see you all. Susie B, what's going on? Hey, Kurt M and Kevin. Kevin will be signing autographs after the show. Line up to the left of the studio, if you don't mind, to the left of the studio. Let's move it on here because we got lots to do tonight. Reynard the Fox, what's happening, man? Good to see you. And Kathy Evans, always a pleasure. Tracy Hendricks, welcome to SOR Chat. The lovely Amy WC and Stephanie Kenny Blankenship. Nice to see you both. Desert Rat and Palmer. And starting in goal tonight with a 2.31 goals against average from Stockholm, Sweden, number 32, Lars Janssen. There he is. Laura Lobbs, nice to have you here. Debster, you're early tonight. JMJ12, welcome back. JMJ12 will be signing autographs after the show as well. Line up to the right of the studio, if you don't mind, to the right of the studio. Continuing on, Ozzy, Ozzy, what's happening? Karen and the Woo Train, thank you for joining us. Andrew Reed, welcome to SOR Chat again. As we continue on with roll call, our favorite Marine, Black Dragon, is here. Thank you for your service, my friend. We really do appreciate it. Doug Shelby is here. The Doug Shelby has arrived on hump day, which means we can officially start this show. Continuing on, let's see here. Mm -hmm. Stargazer, what's happening? And who else is here? Let's see. Scrolling down, Nancy Thames. Nice to see you. And uh, more conversation between everybody. Dewey Cheetah and How, T Bone, Jessica S. Nice to see you. Pixie Lara, thank you for stopping on in. Nick Adkins, just another guy named Harry. Susan Alloway, Be the Arrow. Good to see you all. Buckethead, my man. What's happening? He's Buckethead. I'm Bumblefoot. Both Guns and Roses. Yeah, see the connection? Bar Madison, welcome to SOR Chat. And uh, let's see here. Who else do we have? D. Henderson, Sandra Kincaid. Thank you, lovely ladies, for joining us as we continue on. Mary R. and Bolenia, my man. What's happening? Android Paranormal, Phil Minervino. Nice to see you. Christine Lynn, thank you for coming on in. Hello there, Anna. How's your evening? Ben Eubanks, how's it going? What's happening? D. Sypha, good to see you. And little Cam on Twitch, what's happening? Continuing on with our roll call, Debster, kick it off the Super Chat tonight. The Super Chat is a wonderful way to support what we do on this show on a nightly basis. So thank you so, so much, Deb. The Unknown, Neil Warden, and let's get the radio side going so that way we can get Bill WD-40 into the chat room to lube us up for tonight's show. You always want to go into a chat very nice and smooth, if you know what I'm saying. Got to be smooth. Let's continue on with our roll call here as we have Richard Elmore, Corey Cole, Pay Parker, and let's see who else. Scrolling on down. 
Digger Dog, thank you for coming on in again, my man. Welsh Hammer, Chastity Moore, welcome to SOR Chat. My Flock, welcome and thank you for that great super chat. Very much appreciate the love, my flock. So thank you so, so much. Good to see you back. And Ann Palmer, looking good tonight. And uh, let's see, do we have um, the unknown? And I think we're almost caught up here. I think we are almost caught up. Hot damn, I think I'm right. Mm -hmm. Oh, Mike Rivers, nice to see you. Mr. E, welcome to SOR Chat, Mexi97. Thanks for coming on in. And Rafin, good to see you. All right, Super Chat is open. So is joining the Space Travelers Club. The link is below in the YouTube description. And you can shop at our Spaced Out Radio store and our website. Horns up. Let's rock. of Central British Columbia to you listening around the world. This, my friends, is Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. We welcome you to tonight's show on our terrestrial affiliates around North America, digitally on Odyssey Radio, TalkStream Live, and KPNL. All of our archives are free. Join us at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. You can follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and on Patreon in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Our website, spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bubblefoot, read the news, wire, check out our swag as well. Tonight's show is brought to you by Chive Charities. Help make the world 10% happier by visiting Chive Charities today. You can find them on our website. We are heading to the Great White North tonight, where we are going to learn about UFOs. Jason Gilbert from UAP Studies Podcast is here and will join us momentarily. Then in hour number three, Steve Stockton from Among the Missing will take care of another spooky story. We will wrap things up with the UFO report and our good friend, little Timmy Senor. Jason Gilmet is the host and creator of the UAP Studies podcast. He is also a researcher for MUFON Canada. Now, his baby, the UAP Studies podcast, is a great source for great UFO information. It's science and fact-based discussions with some of the biggest names in ufology, whether it's Gary Nolan, whether it's Lou Elizondo, whether it's Jacques Vallée, or any of the sorts, he has interviewed them. Yeah, the UFO phenomena, military witness testimonies, alien abduction, he gets into it all. But what truly is going on is what keeps Jason going on a nightly and daily basis. Jason Gilbert, it's always a pleasure to have you on Spaced Out Radio. Uh, it's been a while, but we're glad to have you back. And hopefully we're actually going to meet up this coming weekend as I will be fishing in your area, combat fishing on the veteran Chilliwack River, trying to get my salmon in. I would definitely love to be able to swing by and see you. So we we already have a location, the meeting location, mm -hmm. which we shall keep secret so men in black don't come after us. But, uh, yeah, and I was going to say, you know what, Dave, it's great. Every single time I'm on your show, you always do the intro where you talk about, hey, do this, do that. Like, you could easily have this recorded and just do a pre-recorded, but you insist on doing it live every night, and that's pretty cool. I don't know if your audience always knows that, but that's an awesome thing. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you for noticing. You know, the scary part about fishing in that area is if you go way back up on the mountain uh, in that area, a couple of miles, if you quad up there or you take an ATV up there right. into, the, into the mountain trails, you actually come across this, this really long, long turn. And then all of a sudden you will see gates that are blocked off that this is a Canadian Armed Forces a military area. And that's where they trained their snipers. Oh, for, really? For Afghanistan. Oh, wow. Is they built a little Afghani town on that mountain. 
in order to train snipers for the Canadian Armed Forces when they were uh, stationed at Kandahar. I never knew that. And that's like right here in my backyard. Right that's in crazy. your backyard, my man. Right yeah. in your backyard. That, yeah. I would love to go hang out in that village, just go see what it looks like. Like, you know, look around like, oh, man, they really did a good job. I, I swear I'm in Afghanistan. And then twink. <laughs> the walls, what right? is that <laughs> yeah, exactly oh, i hope the worst guy is on the job that day for sure no kidding. yeah that's cool that's you cool. gotta be careful with that one be careful with that one that's all i'm saying you know you you don't want to accidentally take one for the home team you know what no, I'm saying? i probably would wear a high vis sort of suit or something you know make sure that they know that i'm there but yeah that's cool that uh, uh even there was a, a, a gentleman that got shot a year or two ago and it was armed forces in that area that found him and, and saved his life. Uh, oh, really? It was like, yeah, some, some guy was going around shooting random people in BC and uh, he went down the Chilbuck Lake road and just shot a guy in a Jeep or something that was minding his own business. But the guy pulled over later on with his gunshot wounds and it was the Canadian army that, uh, that helped him and made sure that he got the help he needed. So yeah, it was pretty cool. Wow. wow. Well, it's good to have you back on the show, my man. And I know we're going to talk about a lot of Canadian stuff going on. And, you know, I know the majority of our audience is in the United States. And and even though this show is is from Canada, you know, we try not to stay, you know, too Canadian, so to speak. Because, you know, with our accent saying oot in a boot and Tim Hortons and hockey and donuts and moose, we don't want to, you know, screw up everything, you know, for our American audience trying don't to, want to lose them. You know, we don't want to lose them. What the hell them. are these guys right. saying? What the hell are these these hosers saying? You know what I'm saying? But the, the point that I'm getting at is there is a big reason why we have to keep the Canadian side going on the UFO front, whether it's UFOs that are being seen against uh, uh, new around nuclear energy facilities in the East, whether it's the, the lower mainland where you live, where there seems to be a triangle that seems to attract black triangles, whether it's shag Harbor or a lot of stuff. And the way Canada and the United States are, are together under NORAD, it's very important to, to try and figure out all facets of this subject, Jason. Yeah, and this I think it was this week they announced a sixth uh, Canadian Mint coin, which is a certified UFO event that took place. And we got six official coins in Canada that recognizes these historical events. Like the Canadian government, acknowledges that this is real that this phenomenon has been investigated by the rcmp which is the i, I don't know dave what is it like the equivalent of the cia slash fbi maybe yeah yeah um i even reached out to CSIS. now CSIS is incredibly good at their job there's a reason why their reputation in the world in espionage is very high it's because they're good at what they do but it's funny that i haven't heard anything from CSIS. i don't think anybody's heard any statements from like, if anybody would look into this, it'd be CSIS, if anything, right? In Canada, I can't think of any other department that would be above that. So it's funny that we haven't heard anything from that end. We have people like Larry Maguire sort of pushing like, hey, this should be really on the Canadians' political agenda. We need to cover this going forward. Our neighbors to the south are doing such. But then it goes quiet and we don't hear anything. There's no new developments. There's like... Uh, I know we have that new project and we could talk about that, the Sky Canada project. But besides that, I haven't heard anything. I, there's no new developments. There's no information on the supposedly two UFOs they shot down over our land. There's no, there's nothing. It's like mum's the word after that. So they come out and say, yeah, something's happening, but we'll just drop it and you guys figure it out. It's weird. Canada's weird that way. It, it is very weird in in regards to how it, it kind of comes together. And, and you know what? Behind the scenes, there is a lot of UFO talk going on. It's a matter of where the information is going. And, and you know, we hear from legends like Grant Cameron and, and Chris Rutkowski who are trying to stay on top of this. But it just seems like, you know, the one thing about Canadian politics is that if we don't talk about it, it doesn't exist. Right. And that really seems to be the the story and the mantra of Justin Trudeau's government. You know, whether or not you like the guy or not, I mean, 
uh, let's just say that you, the only thing good about him is his socks and his sock collection. Don't insult the sock collection, Jason. Well, uh, no, no, no. There's one thing you had to pick, I guess. The socks yeah. can stay, right? Yeah. yeah <laughs> socks can stay. Yeah. You know, but, but no, personal feelings aside, Canada has always had that reputation. Or if we don't talk about it, it never happens. That's why you never hear Canadians bragging about great missions when they when the United Nations actually used to do military work. Yeah, you know, you never hear about that. It and it just seems like uh, it's a lost art, Jason, when it comes to UFOs. Yeah, I think well, Canadians are humble. Even World War One, World War Two, can, uh, Canadians were known as stormtroopers. We would go an area where even the United States would be like, mm -mm, we're not doing that. And we'd be like, yeah, we'll do it. And we got the job done. But we never got recognition from Hollywood from that. Hollywood's never done a movie based on Canadians fighting the Nazis. It's always America. America showed up late to the Nazi party. I'll, you know what I mean? Uh, you know, fighting the Nazis. Canada was already involved in a war for two or three years before that. But again, there's no recognition. We don't make a big deal out of it. We just did our duty. We got the job done. We don't brag about it. We don't make Hollywood movies glorifying it. We're humble. Um, unfortunately, this sort of comes back and bites us in the butt because I think we're humble about too many things, or at least we're, we're trying to keep modest and not bring too much heat to the table. But I think when it comes down to UFOs, it doesn't matter what nation you are. You should raise the alarm. This is a very big big situation canada's vast lands that are not populated that are left on touch we don't know what activity takes over that spot of land we have nobody there to monitor that i'm sure if we were dense like the you know population like the states you would have a, a lot more of an idea of how much activity is taking place over the whole span of land in canada but unfortunately we don't um it's it's Big city centers like Quebec, uh, Toronto, and BC, I think, is number three, according to Chris Rakowski, our good buddy. He should be on here tonight. He's the expert on all the stats in Canada. Um, I always follow his work. But those are the three major areas where sightings are, are taking place, and that's because there's a lot more people. There's bigger populations. Now, that's not to say that Gimli, Manitoba, doesn't have sightings or uh, up in none of it or stuff like that. They don't have sightings. It's just not reported. Uh, as frequently as it's reported in the big city centers. And if you guys remember that, you know, maybe one out of 10 people will actually go through the process of submitting a sighting. Uh, there's a lot of people that see things that never report anything, that keep silent. They might talk to the neighbors about it, but generally it's not spoken about in the community. And uh, that's something a very uh, that interests me quite a bit. And the other aspect of Canada, which I think stops us from talking about it openly, is we have large centers of um, different cultures. Like in, in, in Vancouver, we have a lot of uh, Asians. We have East Indian populations uh, closer in the Fraser Valley. These are all different cultures that have different values. There's things they talk about or don't talk about based on their cultures and their spirituality. And for instance, I, I talked to a lady who's in charge of doing uh, hypno therapy on people who have alien abductions here in the Fraser Valley. And I asked her about why is it that we never hear anything from the East Indian community uh, community. And she says it still happens to them. It's just that they can't talk about it to their families. It's, it's taboo. It's not something you talk about. Even if you had a close encounter, heck you can wake up and they're in your room. It doesn't matter. You don't address it. And that's a way to people to be silent. It, does, it doesn't have to be the government that silence you. It could be your community, your surroundings, your peers. And that's something in Canada that, that you know, is we have a lot of different communities, different values, and that may actually impede us from having this open discussion. No, I can, I can totally see that. I, I see exactly where you're going. And one of the areas that you live in is you live in a place called Chilliwack, British Columbia, where it's on the eastern part of the Fraser Valley and very much known as a as a hotbed for nature hotbed yeah, for beautiful place a hotbed for farming and a fishing, great sense of community yeah. fishing hunting uh and it's corn it's, got corn, great corn yes. 
Yeah. I, I, I got to admit, man, before last time I was in the lower mainland, before I left Chilliwack, I spent like 50 bucks on corn. Oh, you have to. Yeah. Corn you have to. Yeah, you have to. You got to gorge. Yeah. Yes. And of course, you know, Molson being right there, a big giant brewery. Oh, that, that definitely helped bring up the face of where I live for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. But, you know, the one thing that I have learned over the years, though, is there seems to be a corridor or a triangle in the Fraser Valley that attracts black triangles. And I don't really understand it. And I, and I wanted to chat with you about this for a long time because there are, so, I've seen two black triangles in this area. So the, the triangle goes, and it's weird because we're talking black triangles. So I don't want anybody to get confused. It goes from Langley, British Columbia, the South part of Langley, British Columbia, which is about 35 minutes East of Vancouver. It goes all the way to hope British Columbia, which is past Chilliwack and then up towards mission British Columbia, where I used to live and then back down towards the Langley area. And that area over the years has seen numerous black triangle sightings, black triangle videos that have been filmed. What is with this area and black triangles as a MUFON Canada researcher? Do you take a lot of those? Well, to tell the truth, I haven't done anything with MUFON as of late, but my independent research into the black triangle case, uh, the Cascade mountains are notorious for, for, Black Triangles, uh, the Fraser Valley, like you mentioned, the Langley, Surrey area, Alder Grove. There's a very famous case. Actually, you can YouTube it. I think there's a video story on it now uh, where a uh, single mother was having a cup of tea with a friend in Alder Grove. Now, Alder Grove is, what, 20 minutes away from me, maybe? And in the backyard at night, a black flying triangle hovered over the house, scared her friend, which was a male. He went inside the house. She decided to stay for five minutes and just look at it. When she finally turned around, when the object left, uh, he was livid with her because she was gone for over 45 minutes and I had left him alone with the kids. She doesn't remember what took place, but then she started getting these flashbacks. And eventually she one night was going to bed. And as she got up the stairs, coming out of her daughter's bedroom was a gray. And it noticed her. It noticed. It noticed her and uh, she f froze on the spot. And she mentioned as it traveled across the hallway, it would sort of be one place and then it just appear somewhere else as if it was just skipping feet. And you wouldn't see the skip in between, if that makes sense, until it was out the door or out the window. And then her daughter started making drawings of the bad doctor that would hurt her. And of course, it looked like a gray and smaller grays around it. So there's a very famous case of that. Uh, grays are associated with the black flying triangles as well as a praying mantis. There seems to be a connection because a lot of the cases, if there's witness to any entities, are usually those ones described. So that's interesting. Uh, but in BC, yeah, you're right. We're, we're getting sightings up to five at a time in the sky. I had one gentleman in Surrey uh, tell me that he's witnessed five at a time in the sky about 2 o'clock in the morning, but high, high up. Well, you could tell they're there, but they're not close enough to get pictures. So I told him, if you get anything, send them to me. Now, one of the cases that, again, takes place in Alder Grove, British Columbia, a uh, mother had reached out to me, she's a young mother, and she says she had taken off on a Sunday to go shopping at, uh, I believe it was a Safeway near her home. So she's leaving Alder Grove, and she's on, uh, is it the Fraser Fraser Highway? Fraser. That? Yeah, so she's on the Fraser Highway. Now, if anybody lives in my area, you know the Fraser Highway is always occupied, full of cars it'd be really, really rare to not have any cars on that highway. It just happens there was no cars. There was no traffic. There was no birds. There was no wind. There was no sound. And when she arrived near a farm, she pulled over to the side of the road because she saw a large black triangle hovering above the farmer's land. She observed it for some time, and then it started moving west. When it started moving west, she started her car again and as she went to veer back onto the road she noticed two government looking vehicles coming out of that farm property at the same time and they noticed her and it scared the bejesus out of her alder grove is right beside the u.s border right so is surrey a lot of these sightings are taking place right on the u.s border canada border 
But like you mentioned, they also go up north to the other cities. I often thought about this, and I don't know, just just a theory, Dave. But you play along with me here and see what you think, okay? Just just thought experiment. Almost, yeah. yeah, it's a thought experiment. Bob Lazar exposes 1989 that the U.S. government has possession of these crafts. It's getting a lot harder to hide anything in the United States of America because with Google Maps and you know people can find out anything these days. It's harder to hide these things. Now it's rumored they're building buildings around massive ones. Because they're so huge, they have to hide them somewhere. But if you're going to move a program of this nature, wouldn't it be best to move it to a country that has vast wilderness that you can experiment with the crafts without really being seen? Moving their material to Canada is a logistic, um, a great logistic move for them. If I was them, I, that's something I would have done. Canada, since 1947, has played ball with the United States in any of its ufo uh, endeavors canada's always been part of it i can definitely assume that a lot of the u.s um, reverse engineering and testing takes place over our country in remote parts where we're not located and uh, i think some of the activity that we see here in the lower mainland has got to do with some of that activity not all i think it's a mixture of things but i think some of it has got to do with uh, possibly you know testing reverse engineering and you know the interesting part about that just to take a step back for a second i remember when i interviewed david politis a couple of years ago and he said the number two place in north america where people go missing is the cascade mountains where people just vanish disappear yeah and yet if you talk to if you talk to any ufologist in the lower mainland from Vancouver on to where you are, there's always UFO sightings around the mountains. I, yeah. I, I, I remember having a great view from my house in mission, British Columbia of Mount Baker in Washington state and Beautiful, myself, right? myself, my kids, and even Samantha Mowat was over at my house and we watched four UFOs on top of the mountain. Four of them just sitting there, big orbs glaring off the top of the mountain. Okay. And the mountains maybe what 50 miles away? Oh, it's a distance away for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's beautiful. But yeah. It is beautiful. And then the interesting part about that was uh you you learn Vancouver airports flight patterns. When they're going into Vancouver, they're behind the lower mainland into the mountains, and when they're leaving, they always take off in front. And all of a sudden, this aircraft. No sound, a little silver aircraft with a long contrail came from northeast heading southwest. No sound right over our house as we're watching the UFOs on Mount Baker. It's crazy. Even here, um, and I hate to admit this because it sounds cliche, but I observed something that I recorded not too long ago, a few weeks ago, that was a cylinder object as far as i could tell I was flying so slow compared to the uh we only have cessna planes above my house so and helicopters so i know what flies above our house constantly but this thing didn't make any sound it was just cylinder shape so i took a video of it and then i showed my wife i'm like can you make sense of this i can't see any like any propulsion i can't see any jets i can't see any tails i can't see any wings like it's really weird and then not even a few nights ago, my wife, again, filmed something strange at night, an orb, which you mentioned the orange orbs. Those are very common in the lower mainland where we live. The orbs are everywhere. They're global, but the orange ones specifically at night uh, are very common in the Fraser Valley for sure. Uh, I only really know what's taking place in my region, but I think guys like uh, Chris Rutkowski, I mean, he's got the data on everything, right? Like he knows what's taking place a, a lot he of locations. He What's that? Figure, he can't figure out the black triangle corridor. It, but I, I think, yeah, it's going to take a while before anybody does. Yeah. True. I'm going to get you to hold on right there because we are going to go to break here at the bottom of the hour from UAP Studies Podcast. We have Jason Gilmet. We're going to continue with black triangles, more UFO sightings, the Canadian side of ufology. We're going to get into it all when we return for the second half hour on the mighty SOR. Stay tuned. Spaced Out Radio continues right after this.
All right, we're clear. Bathroom break. <laughs> I'll be right back, brother. <laughs> Two go. seconds, man. No problem. All right. TR3Bs. Gorgeous Kim Jellen, how are you? And who else? Derek Galloway is here. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have a little sip of water here. Want to see me make uh, Kira happy? It's water, Kira. <laughs> I know she's eye-rolling me right now. I love you, Kira. I just like bugging you. <clears throat> Dirty Filth, why aren't you in here drawing cartoons? Robert... Anthony, how's it going? By the way, one of our newest listeners here, let me find them in the chat room here. We got to give a round of applause for Ulimer. There he is saying, Julie, thanks a lot. From Czechia. From Czechia. The former Czechoslovakia or Czech Republic. Welcome. We're going to put you on the map here. Right about uh, where are we here? Right about there is where you are. Right there. Mm -hmm. Thank you for listening. I love it when we get people from new countries coming on in. Vin Man, how you doing? Lucy Bell, Lucy Bell, 47. Everybody loves Lucy Bell, 47. Hello, slow motion. Juliana, where have you been hiding lately? Hello, Mark Sanchez. Lee Labresh. Welcome to SOR chat. And let's see here. Who else is joining us? I think we're caught up. Oh, Joe Ferreira from Brazil. How you doing? Gotta get you. I think I got you marked down there. I, I put up this world map so that and it's a pin cushion. So that way I can uh, mark down where everybody's from. That's actually a really good idea. Yeah. It's kind of cool once you start seeing the pins in there, you know? Exactly who's where. Yeah. Oh, Terry Hall and his fantastic mustache. Yep. <laughs> he's got he's just got one of those badass handlebars. Nice. Yeah, it comes down to about here. That that's a business. Yeah. That's in shape. You call oh, him yeah. sir. You call him oh. sir. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's Harley Davidson one hundred and one right there. You know, I love saying? watching those old pictures of you know the old men from you know manly men. I mean, from old times when they wore their their pants up to like you know past the navel, that big handlebar. They were like, oh yeah, like this. You know, the big manly men posing like this. Yeah. Oh yeah. And, it, and the thing is, you're like, oh, bunch of sissies. But if you were to fight one of those guys, you'd get your ass kicked. Like those were a different I, breed of men back then. You my know? grand, my Ukrainian grandmother's 95, and guaranteed she could still one punch me. Her hand, her big farmer hands are like twice the size of mine. Right? <laughs> She'd knock right? you right out. Yeah. Oh, grandma, grandma, to this, <clears throat> give me a little shot in the arm, and I'll be like, son of a, you want to go? Come yeah. on. I still, the best handshake I've ever gotten was from an older Irish lady. Best handshake of my life. I was like, wow, I was taken aback. Like, she's like, how's it going, sad? Does she, or lad, and she just grabbed my arms and I was like, wow, that's, that's the most manliest oh, yeah. handshake I've ever received. <laughs> Divine Light Codes, how you doing? Nice to see you. Uh, mm, nice to have you back. Mm hmm. 
And Lori Bell with a $2 super chat. Thank you, Lori. Along with our good friends, uh, Simon, T-Bone, My Flock, and Debster for the super chats. Great way to support what we do on this show. Hey, check the description of the show below because you can join our Space Travelers Club for as low as 5 bucks a month. The link is in there, and you can do your shopping at spacedoutradio.com because we don't have ugly swag. Here we go, the second half hour. Second half hour of Space Down Radio is now underway, talking to UFOs in Canada. My name is Dave Scott. Very much appreciate earning your listening ears. Reminder to all of you that if you miss portions of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website, spacedoutradio.com. We got a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read the news wire, check out our swag. Follow us on Twitter at spaced out radio. Still not sure if I should call it X or Twitter. I don't even know anymore. Instagram at spaced out radio show. And on Patreon, you can join our Space Travelers Club. Here we go. Jason Gilbert from UAP Studies Podcast. We're talking about these black triangles that people are seeing in the lower mainland of British Columbia, Canada, which is Vancouver East. If you're driving and on the driver's scale, you're about 100 kilometers an hour, 62.5 miles per hour to Jason's house. That's that's accurate. That's accurate. I was going to say, you don't know whether to call it X or Twitter. It's kind of like when Prince changed his name to like a symbol. And we were all kind of like, yeah, we're not doing that. Like, you know, we're not we're not going to call you whatever that symbol is. That's that's kind of what the X and Twitter thing is is reminding me of. But yeah, no, the the, the black triangles are, are an interesting case. Uh, it's, just, it's not that they're exclusive to BC, but they're more uh, known in BC. Like they're, they're seen more often, but along with the orbs. The orbs, although mentioned in recently that this is a global issue, and I know that uh, the Five Eyes have covered that, that the orbs are seen globally and they don't know what it is. As far as I'm concerned, theory-wise, they're, you know, they're surveying land or they're monitoring. Like these, these things fly at high speeds and yet don't crash into anything. I've never heard of one crashing into anything yet. It's amazing. But the drone footage that people are showing of these things flying across their shots or uh, things that are in the skies, it's fascinating. At the same time, it's scary. Uh, I interviewed two twin brothers from England, the Kinsella brothers. And when they were 14, an orb flew over them and their mother. It was about 10 feet above their heads. And they observed it, and they knew that it, it was looking at them somehow. They just felt it inwardly. Although the orb flew away, not too long afterwards, the brothers at different times were abducted. So to me, it's kind of like, are the orbs what they use to look for certain people? Because it's funny that the orbs appear and then an abduction happens. So it's almost like the orbs are a harbinger of some sort, at least for us, to know that something's about to happen or it's a hot spot. Recently, Netflix has put out that uh, documentary and they were talking about, um, you know, nuclear facilities and UFOs being interested in anything nuclear, which they are. We now know that the Navy has moved everything to nuclear powered. And since then, they haven't been left alone by these things at all. (laughs) Right. So anything every time we tamper with with nuclear, anything, these things are around. And the orbs specifically are around these nuclear facilities uh, in Toronto. I know uh, Daniel Otis is covering this right now, uh, but in Toronto, there was memos released about these orbs around the Canadian uh, sites that we have here, uh, nuclear sites, which we don't have a lot of, but these sightings were substantial enough for a, a, a briefing to be issued. And yet nobody talks about this. It's, it's not open to the public. This should be open to the public. And this is what we're talking about full transparency is that if the government is aware that something weird is happening around something that they're involved in, it should be disclosed. It's not national security. 
at this point, we got to stop saying national security because it's global security at this point. It's not national. The whole planet gets taken over. It's your nation ain't going to do nothing, right? So it's a global problem. And the problem that we're, that we're facing today is that we have set boundaries in our thinking, in our operating. Uh, here's the thing. You guys could come out and say, yes, UFOs are real, but unless the other countries in the world are willing to play ball and say, yes, we know this, we should unite and have some sort of situation or committee uh, con concerning this, every country is trying to face this for their own. Canada cannot face this on their own. They've been tied to the hip with the U.S. on this for a long time, since the 1940s. I don't think Canada will ever take the initiative to say, hey, let's be the leaders in disclosure They'll always be the person that's behind everyone. Our media, Dave, you know this as much as I do, is horrible at covering UAPs. You know, in the States, you have like news nations and you got CNN. Like They'll jump on it. Our news coverage, uh, now keep in mind it's limited under Trudeau's new regime that we're not allowed to get certain news and stuff like that on programs. And that's it's all filtered and uh, dictated what we're allowed to see and not see. So that's another problem. Like if you want to, you know... Huge. Huge problem in Canada. Um, and again, we're, we're so just apathetic. We just let all this stuff happen. We should be a lot more proactive. Uh, disappointingly, you know, even for UAP studies, as good as we're doing globally, Canada is actually one of our least, uh, uh, we have we don't have much of an audience in Canada. I can tell you right now, my can for a Canadian show, I'm at 81% American listener. Oh, wow. Yeah, and good. I, and I am at a less than 9% of my audience is Canadian. Yeah, 7 for me. Yeah, less than 7% of the audience is Canadian. Uh, America, England, Australia, they all beat yeah. Canada by far. And I, I don't know if it's a, a population amount differences or we just we don't care or we just we're used to it. We don't. It's not a big deal, but it is a big deal. And we should make a big deal of it. There's been plenty of cases in Canada that were big deals that are known as worldwide cases, like the, the Falcon Lake incidents, the Shag sure. Harbor. I mean, we've had inside the uh, Charlie, you know, like we had plenty of cases here in Canada that well, we have six coins for crying out loud, six coins, official yeah. coins. Like, it's and you crazy. Know the, interesting part, the interesting part about the Canadian Mint coming out with those six UFO coins, which are major collector's items, especially to American collectors of all things. Okay. Canada's Mint, the Canadian Mint in Winnipeg, which creates all of our money and all of the, uh, all of the money and all of the coins and specialty coins, they only make coins about Canadian heritage hmm. and, and the heritage minister, whoever that is at the time has to approve the coins, the specialty coins that are put out annually. And the weird part about it is, and I asked this question, nobody ever answered it is when did UFOs become a part of Canada's heritage? Well, that's a good one. That's a good one. I think we accepted it maybe from the start, right? There's a case in Ontario that dates back a very, very long time. It's one of the first, the first ever recorded UFO sighting in North America that was ever written down. And that took place somewhere in Ontario in the 1700s or something, something crazy. Uh, I think this has always been the case. And I think you and I have been studying this long enough that we know this has always been the case, that they've always been here that this isn't new it's not like new activity it's not we just discovered that they're here we're just admitting to it now you know i think we always knew in the background that something was going on we're just admitting it now there's too many of us have had too many encounters and if it's not us personally it's somebody close to us very close to us that we know they would have no reason to ever lie about something like this so and, and not to say that but like most likely if you go outside you'll see something at some point, right? So everybody experiences something, but some of us, it's close encounters. 
And those create a synchronicity between the objective and the subjective, the inner and outer world. What is out here, what's inside of you somehow syncs up. And then it's a paradigm shift. You, your whole viewpoint of your life changes from that moment on. Anybody who's had a close encounter, it doesn't matter where globally, that synchronicity happened. You could literally see from that day forward how they changed. Their mood changed, their perspective changed, everything changed. It's hard to do that to a human, right? It has to be a life-changing moment that makes somebody go through those steps. These people do it overnight. They tell you something happened the night before, and their whole life has changed from that point on. Their viewpoints, the way they talk, the way they view the universe, everything. That is evidence in and of itself. It's rare to see anybody do that change over a period of time, much less instantly over a night where an event took place or a day where an event took place. And this is what we have to start paying attention to, to the people coming forward and saying, I had a close encounter, hear me out. It's different if somebody says, I think that I'm communicating with aliens. It's a lot different than, I, I don't believe in aliens, but I woke up in the middle of the night and there was four entities in a bright light in my room. And next thing I knew, I'm floating out of my walls. And you're going through the walls and the window. Try to wrap your head around that as that's happening, Right. It's so strange what's happening to people because there's no point of reference. It's hard to recount the events because there's no, I can't tell you what I saw because you never seen what I saw because I never saw it. And you know what I mean? Like it's complex. It's, it's a very emotional and very subjective um, effect that takes place on people after a sighting. I think Canada is no different than that. A lot of Canadians are feeling that and you can tell it in their stories. Like, look, this isn't normal. and. Instead of saying, well, the person, you know, who is he? He works at a mill, so he must not know what he's talking about because he works at a mill. Well, if he's 49 years old, he's a expert, human expert for 49 years. He's lived amongst humans. He knows what's in the sky and what's not, what's normal, what's not. And we have to start looking at that instead of just dismissing everybody for like, well, if there's an out anywhere in any story, a critic will take it. You got guys like Mac West. If there's anything that they can pick apart, they'll pick on it. They'll delete everything else around it just to pick apart, just because it gives them an exit to not have to worry about what this all means. And it's huge. This The implication of this, I mean, it's way bigger than the Canadian government. I'm sorry, but they're about as useless as this butthole right here, right? When it comes down to this issue, they can't do anything about it. Nor can the American government do anything about it. The American government might be, or secretly, the you know deep state, if you will, might be reverse engineering these technologies but they can't intercept. If these things uh, come down and they take people for whatever reason, they're not going to dispatch jets to prevent them from doing that. They're way too quick, way too fast. And they've been at it for a long time. There's just nothing we can do. So this is why I mean it's bigger than government and military. It's on an individual bis uh, basis at this point. It involves you and your kids, the safety of you and your kids, and the government and police can't do anything to help you. So this is why we need to take this subject more seriously than we do. I think we live under a lot of fake security, especially up north in Canada. I think we are we feel a lot more secure than we should be. Uh, but that's just the way it is. And when it comes down to this phenomenon, I just wish there was more open debate from our politicians, especially now that we might be going into an election. I would love to see it be on their political debate and their platforms. And I'd love to go to a town hall meeting and, ask him a few questions in regards to this, because I think it's going forward I'm in East Park. That. What's I'm that? Planning. I'm planning that. All right. You should do it, dude. You well, should do you, it. You know, yeah. you know what's funny is we're spaced out. Radio is still the only radio station that has had a long form interview with Larry McGuire. Right. Regarding UFOs. And you know, because I know you've tried to get him. It's a hard interview to get. Difficult. Right. Yeah. Very, Very hard. Difficult. interview. Yeah, and so I, I'm very fortunate about that. But my member of parliament, okay, gentleman named Frank Caputo, okay, who I when I when he came in to my office, my daytime office, shaking hands, <coughs> excuse me, uh, introducing himself. One of the first questions I said to him, I said, look, you're already going to get my vote. 
All right. You're already going to get my vote. I said, what do you know about UFOs? And he goes, huh? I said, what do you know about UFOs? And he's like, uh, not too much. Not really on my radar. I said, well, I said, many in your party, if you get elected, many in your party are very much into this subject. And one day I'd like to talk to you about it because I have connections there. And he's like, yeah, oh, great, great, great. He ends up being the assistant shadow minister for defense. I've tried calling him five, six times, emailing him even more. Never got a response back. So Smoke guess who? So guess who's going to embarrass <coughs> his at the at the town forum? Good. Yeah, I'm yeah. going to. You know, yeah. I, I absolutely plan on it. Well, it's and that's the thing is that it needs to be pushed now into the political realm and agenda because we're at that point. We're at the breaking point, right? Uh, it's it's hard, right, to go back at this point since we've gone this much into disclosure and and the whistleblowers. I mean, reportedly there's like thirty plus whistleblowers coming out soon that have had first hand experience on some of this reverse engineer or. Um, in possession of these non-human entities, as they call them now, aka aliens, or they used to be known as aliens, and we call them non-humans for whatever reason. But it's amazing. I think what five years, you know, from since the article that came out in 2017 to now, how much progress we've had, you know, because before that article came out, the day before that article came out, it was dry it was dusty there was nothing to talk about except old Fine. cases right and uh to make this much progress since that time is it's fabulous but only that but it forces people to come out of the woodworks true right because I wanna, the, yeah i want to ask you because i know i get a lot of this question why do you think and i i know your bias here okay so i'm going to ask you to control your bias here oh boy Okay, why do you think Justin Trudeau has never talked about UFOs? It's hard to talk about something that's not part of your agenda, right? If you think about it, if the liberal government right now limited what Canadians can see in news, and this is a huge, huge deal, like Google controls it, Facebook and all that, I mean, we're... Even our programs, Dave, are threatened that if they're deemed not appropriate according to their standards, they can just shut us down now, right? It's, Pretty scary. It's scary. It, it, it right? is very, and on a truthful note, that is something that every everybody who <laughs> loves this show or or any show out of Canada that's a podcast or or radio show right now, you need to send a letter to the Canadian government. Absolutely. It, yeah. You know. I'm not going to use the C word for communism, okay? But it's really getting to that point here regarding what we can and cannot say regarding this subject. It's not only this subject, but also words. It's controlling words, what's allowed, what's not allowed. It's like this self-policing system that none of us voted in, but that's the agenda. There's no... You know, if you look at what's going on right now, none of us are getting any relief from the food prices. We're giving $9 billion away to Ukraine while all of us are losing our homes. Mortgages are more expensive than we can add. Like they spiked how much? Like people's went from $1,600 a month to $5,000 a month just because they couldn't lock in rates. It's ridiculous. Like we're not in good shape. Canada has bigger problems right now than UAPs as far as, you know, the opposing political parties concerned. And I understand that liberals have no intentions of being part of this. It doesn't serve their agenda and there is an agenda and that's just not part of it. If it happens to be that it needs to be mentioned, they'll mention it, but it's not a big deal. I think conservatives would be more keen to releasing this information because they're more mature about it. And they understand that it, this is a necessity for people to know what we're dealing with as a nation, as a people. And not only that, but it's rep representative in the world. Like if we can get our image back, 
you know, Canada's image is down the tubes right now, but if we could get our image back and we could at least say, Hey, we're, we're going to, if you want to do UAP disclosure, we'll, we're right there with you. It doesn't matter what country we're right there with you. We'll back you up. That'd be great. But we're far, a far distance away from that. I think we, there's so many issues that we have to resolve as Canadians right now before we can address the UAP issues. But if we can address it on the side, like not bring it into political, let's say necessarily um, system, but just say it on the side, as Canadians, we need to address this, right? Especially the big centers that see this more. Like, I don't know what small towns are seeing, and I'm sure they're seeing stuff there too, but the bigger city centers like Vancouver, Toronto, Quebec City, Montreal, they see this stuff all the time. That should be something that's more on their agenda to address and saying, what are we looking at in our sky? It's not a military. It's not our pilots. Even our pilots are reporting these things constantly. Uh, American pilots are reporting things over Canada skies. Canadian pilots are reporting things over Canadian skies. It's nonstop. So yeah, this is very interesting. I'm, and the, the black triangles, it's crazy because I haven't read any reports of pilots at high altitudes necessarily reporting them, but it's always at lower altitudes. Like people will see them when they're closer to the border at night. Uh, Chilliwack had a sighting in 1997, I believe, which the black triangle was above five corners downtown. And it was hundreds of people that just looked up and saw it, but there was only two reports ever made to move on about it. It's seen everywhere, uh, and it's a large craft. Sometimes they see the lights at, at uh, light at three points, and then sometimes a light in the center as well. The TR three B is what we hear the most, right, Dave? Is yes. everybody thinks it's that it's that craft? Well, they must be flying it. It's which I can't rule it out. It's possible, uh, but it's weird. It's just weird that they have this much activity over Canadian airspace and ceases. There's nothing from them. There's no investigation, as far as we know. Uh, nobody's talking about newspapers are mum about it. Like it is just silent. It's weird because this takes place so often that, you know, UFO BC is just swamped with cases like this or people reporting them. So it's quite, it's quite interesting. And I hope there's more people in BC that are starting to look into this seriously because it is a cause for concern. Like, what are they? Like they're way too big to be above our heads and nobody pay attention to them. Like, these things are the size of a football field or two. Like, it's crazy. And uh, anything that big flying over airspace that doesn't make a sound, has no propellers or jets, we should be investigating that. I don't know how we're asleep at night and just totally okay with it. Like, it's uh, it's scary. It's, it, it freaks the, the hell out of me. I'm not going to lie to you. I've been doing UFO research for a while, but this one scares me. Uh, if it wasn't for those two reports from those two uh, mothers... I don't think I'd be as, as scared, but it's like there's something going on. And I don't know if the government's aware of it, but those two cars that came out of the farmland after that uh, first witness uh, had mentioned that the, the craft was moving west and the two cars had come out. Why? Why is there two government-looking cars? Were, were they agencies? Were they people talking to the pilots? Were they human pilots? Like, it raises a bunch of questions that... Uh, just forces you to go down the rabbit hole deeper. But again, there's no answers because you can't get answers, right? Uh, I tried calling CSIS and asking them if they would come on record to talk UAPs on the podcast and nothing. I'm sure they looked me up and did the whole research on everything, make sure it wasn't a, a crackpot. But yeah, it's it's weird, Dave. I don't I don't know what our Canadian government is planning on doing about this. Yeah, I do know that there is a lot of talk behind the scenes okay, about whether or not Canada can get back into the UFO game, much like in the days of Wilbur Smith, where the United States government was contacting Wilbur to to actually get information regarding the UFOs. But I do know that it's happening. I also know that places like the Canadian Space Agency are taking their their word from NASA on what to do, the alphabet agencies, whether it's CSIS or the or the uh, Department of Energy that Canada has, they're all taking uh, silence right now, and we'll get into that. The silence of UFOs in Canada with Jason Gilman from UAP Studies Podcast. We will be right back on Spaced Out Radio for hour number two, 
And if we got some, we'll take audience questions as well. We'll be right back. All right, man, I'm going to put you in the green room. I'm going to just step away for a quick break. I'll be right back, okay? No worries, brother. All right, we'll be right back, guys. All right, how we all doing? Good to see you all. Good to see you all. All right, sweet Donna C, welcome back. And who else is coming in late here? Uh, Jason's got some Zeds. <laughs> <clears throat> Silver Fox One, welcome back. 
<coughs> Desoir. And <coughs> oh, this cold. Yeah, you're, you got a good one there. Chicago 420. Welcome. Hmm, Lucifer, nice to see you back from hell. And uh, Gee Calgary, what's happening? <laughs> Your comment, Gee, so correct. So correct. Oh. <clears throat> All right, we got about just under a minute here. No worries. And a big thank you tonight to Lori, Simon, T Bone, My Flock, and Deb for the amazing super chats. It's a wonderful way to support what we do on this show on a nightly basis. Also, if you want to support us monthly, you can join the Space Travelers Club. The link is below in the show description on Patreon. And, hey, guess what? We don't have ugly swag like some people do and other shows do. Go to our store, spacedoutradio.com, pick up some swag today. You can look good. You you really can. You know, at least I think you will. But who Get decked out. Get spaced out. You got that right. Hey, Ted Ozzy, welcome to SOR Chat. Three seconds. Here we go. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott. Follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Facebook Spaced Out Radio Show. Here we go with hour number two of Spaced Out Radio tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Very much appreciate earning your listening ears wherever you are on this beautiful planet we call Earth. Hello to everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America, digitally on Odyssey Radio, Talk Stream Live, and KPNL. All of our archives are free. Join us at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. We send, we send is your password. Use it wisely, Space Travelers, as the Clam sets the password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website, spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read the newswire, check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and you can join us on Patreon in the SOR Space Travelers Club. We continue on with a great conversation that we're having tonight with Jason Gilmet, hosted creator of UAP Studies Podcast. He's a UFO researcher as well. Jason, thank you so much for being here tonight. Hey, always my pleasure, Dave. It's always it's always fun to hang out. I always I always look at this as it's just like you and me sitting around drinking coffee or having a few beers, you know, just talking UAPs or just whatever. It's uh, I, I look forward to this. Do you think that Canada is close to having any Canadian whistleblowers, fighter pilots coming out and talking about this? We have to. I think we have to. I. I I'd be surprised if there wasn't some sort of whistleblower. I mean, the closest that we got is probably Larry McGuire as far as whistleblower government or at least somebody saying, hey, something's happening. We need to look into this. These are actual cases that I've seen with my own eyes that need to be investigated. And that's where the whistleblowing is coming more from directly from Parliament or from our MPs as opposed to coming from the military. But it is the men and women of the military coming forward and saying, I worked for my country. This is what our country is keeping secret from my fellow citizens. In a sense, and I don't know how you would place this, Dave, but to me, there's no bigger act of treason than to hold an information like this from the general population and much less to use technology that is not human made so for non-human technology against other humans, right? Uh, to me, there's no bigger treason in the world than that. And I don't care what country is doing it to what, uh, but they have to answer to that, that there's no, that's not acceptable by any means. Uh, and it should be punished. But the thing is, the longer you keep 
the whistleblowers at bay and you keep this from coming out to light, the more repercussions there's going to be because more people's lives are ruined. And this is why the whistleblowers are coming forward. I mean, these guys are getting threats to their families, to their careers. Um, David Grush talked about what happens if you even question things like in, in the myth, military, you could say goodbye to your career. They'll, they'll crush you. If you're not in the military, they'll threaten you. And these guys have done this time and time and again, What's weird is globally, like this could take place in England. They show up at your door the next day, knock on your door, tell you to be quiet. I don't know if it's the U.S. doing that or if it's a global organization doing that, but it's weird that people are being threatened to keep this secret. They're willing to kill and have killed to keep this a secret. You got to think about how much money every year is allocated to defending this secret. Right? We're talking billions, like to, to hire the people to keep this secret uh do the internet searches and all that to delete people to uh, discredit them like ross coulthard is another prime example they'll come after him they'll try to discredit him right if you come forward whatever minute things you might have done in your past that somebody could say it's questionable they'll throw it out there they'll use it their tactics are still the same they might change the way they play the game but their tactics are still the same and they're still going to operate this way so it's up to the military uh, men and women in services coming forward and saying, look, this is what I was told to do. This is what I witnessed. And then we start collecting the evidence or putting the pieces of the puzzle together. But whoever is at the top, whoever's calling the shots was not an elected official. By the sounds of it, all of our elected officials are not in the know of any of these programs. There's no oversight to these programs. And they're making decisions based on all humans without our consent right uh if you think about it starting something that you don't understand technology that could destroy the world and you go go ahead turn it on i just made the decision for eight billion people right i have that authority i don't have that authority no man has that authority to do that so like i said to me it's it's an act of treason for the citizens of this world if this is part of reality and part of what we're dealing with and it's been kept against us, and the technology is now being used against us. Uh, it, like I said, there's got to be some sort of, uh, of upheaval. Like there's got to be, we got to speak up. We got to do something. This is not right. And they've wrecked enough people's lives already, keeping this under wraps. Whether you've seen something or you're an experiencer, which is already traumatic enough, and having the government come and tell you you better shut up about it, or things will happen we know your kids go to school and maybe you guys don't make it home from your christmas party uh there's threats like that all the time going out to people that's what we have to remember like coming forward for most people is not worth it there's too many risks and we say oh they just want their 15 minutes of fame ask that to bob lazar ask him if his 15 minutes of fame was worth it it's not they ruin your life they still raid him you know for no reason They'll still raid him. There's no reason why they're doing it. It's just to drive him nuts or drive the point home. We got the upper hand. And that's the part that's scary about all this is that I don't know if Canada just willingly go along with the what the states have set as a foundation, as proceedings for this, or if we have our own system, which I doubt. So I think the latter rather than the former, as far as I'm concerned. Jason, the, the idea that there is a cover-up going on in the military, you know, I, I I can understand why. A lot of these people do not want to risk their pensions. They don't want to risk their livelihood. I, I know I had military clients who uh, both husband and wife served 20 years in the Canadian Navy. Hmm. Okay. They're making, between the both of them, probably 8000 a month just on pensions because of their tenure in the military. Yeah, and they've earned I mean, it. That's, yeah. that's a lot of money to give up, though, to talk UFOs, okay, and, and to, to maybe break an NDA, even if there was a whistleblower act, you know? And I just don't even know if, if Canada had any interest in this, which, like you said, politically, between inflation and, and food prices and carbon taxes and everything, that it is not the UFO story has fallen way down the the chain of importance yeah. politically, yeah. you know? So, I mean, it, there is, to me, there's not even an understanding of why they would, that I guess what I'm trying to say is the Canadian government 
isn't like the U.S. government where they can do multi things at once. We can handle maybe three or four things at best, <laughs> at best. <laughs> but yeah, you throw in you throw in that fifth that fifth part. Okay, it doesn't seem to work. You know. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, even with their programs, I mean, this Sky Canada project. I still don't know much about the project. This, the fact that they're supposed to be more transparent, and they get their information from transport canada which transport canada used to be the place if you want to talk about us not having anywhere to report our sightings transport canada is a black hole of submissions that will never go anywhere and never be used for anything uh even when i talked transport canada I said hey can you can i get information on uh uap so no, we don't do that okay who does this this is the problem that i have this is the part that irks me there was a, a video um i think you saw it too where they were talking about the the space force and they're asking about uaps it says well it's not really our domain and the other person says, oh, it's not my responsibility whose is it whose is it if it's not space force if it's not nasa whose responsibility is it it's got to be in there like the protection of the planet has got to be in there somewhere everybody's like ah, it's not me is it you no it's not me is it you no it's not me let's all congratulate ourselves it's like whose job is it to do it like this whole pass the puck thing and i'm sorry i've been outspoken about arrow before dave but i do not like the resolution office they don't resolve anything their job is to pass the puck or to hide the puck they don't really do anything with it kirk patrick should have never been hired in the first place to do that job if anybody's more resentful of his position it is that dude and the other aspect that really irks me is instead of starting with people who know what they're doing the first thing that i would do if i started the resolution office is i would go hire jack valet a guy who's been doing the research and is far more intelligent than i am or will ever be on this subject to be one of the head of the scientific community and help guide no they start from scratch let's get bill over there from accounting and you know oh my cousin ted he's pretty good with ufo documentaries let's get him on like what are they doing what are we doing like why are we allowing them to spend money on like well it requires further research look we'd be a lot further ahead if they would just start from the research that's already been established they're not going to come to a different conclusion than us they're going to follow the rabbit trail they're going to follow the crumbs and it'll lead to the exact same spot that you and i dave have been at and many other ufologists across the world have been at for decades right so why why do they start from scratch all the time this includes the canadian government it drives me crazy and at least what are the credentials of the people that are under your team i would like to know every credential you know are they biased towards this like what makes them qualified to do this uh, what's their background? Do they have any history in ufology? Like, there's no question. We just go, oh, yeah, no, they're on top of it. But at this point, there's too many smart people to to pull that off. And the other question is, who is Canada? <coughs> who's Canada is David Grush or or Lou Elizondo? Good right? point. Good point. We, we do know that each and every branch, whether it's whether it's uh, Transport Canada. <clears throat> NAV Canada, CSIS, the Department of National Defense, the, the Ministry of Energy and Nuclear Energy, we know they all have their own files on UFOs. Yeah. That has been proven. Okay. Nobody wants to talk about it, though. So the question is if this has been happening, who is the 2023 version of Wilbur Smith? Who is, uh, is the person or persons? Who are the Lou Elizondo of Canada? You know, there's a woo desk. We all know that, uh, you know, in my studies from people I've talked to, they believe that there is a desk of about eight to 15 people, which includes RCMP officers and CSIS and everybody who's talking about this, but they keep it under wraps. They don't yeah. want people to do it. I mean, they give Chris Rutkowski a little bit at a time, but Chris isn't that guy. Okay. Who, who is that person? And I think that's a question that needs to be asked once uh, scientists, the Canada's head scientist, Dr. Mona Niemer gets 
all the files. And I think the problem that she's having is a lot of these alphabet agencies aren't cooperating in giving her the files the way that the members of parliament are asking them to. Yeah, well, it's it well, it's it's muddying the waters, right? And playing the department of it's, it's not my job, it's not my job. Like everybody passes the puck along, and it's frustrating because you know the information is out there somewhere. And by the time you get to the actual location where you think you'll get the information, and the Freedom of Information Act works a little bit different. I know is it John Greenwald of the Black Vault? Yes. Um, yeah, he gets like he's really good at. You know freedom of information uh, releases of course are always redacted it's like they just get black pages like everything's just you know he gets like the end like the word the in the whole page and that's it like it's funny what they give them uh but canada it's hard to find any of that information and again dave i would say that because everything ufo related got outsources to the states the states have taken like if you think about it norad in north america it's the states primarily that are part of norad there is some canadian jets but the united states were the one who intercepted these ufos which they're still ufos um in last february um and i say they're still ufos because we still don't know what it is. it's kind of like epstein you know it just went away they never really caught anything they never really said anything about it it just disappeared um it's the same thing with these canadian ufos they shot down and it's interesting because uh, Daniel Otis even mentioned this in his recent project about the memo that Trudeau got about these UFOs that are still not identified. They still didn't know what the flying characteristics of these things were. And this is not to minimize what a fighter pilot is trained in their report, his or her report, very specifically they're trained. They could the observers like you can't believe the, there's no higher observers than fighter pilots hands down in the sky. So let's just end that debate right there. There's nobody better than that. With their instrumentation to boot, they're the, they're, they know everything when they're at that location in front of that um, technology, and they can identify it with all the technology that we have in 2023 and their expertise and flying time and uh, millions of dollars we spent on them. They can not identify these objects. You know, we minimize that. We say, oh, well, it could have been a Chinese balloon. It's easy to sleep at night when you continuously just say, well, it could have been. Because it's always, like I said, it's always an out. You know, you always have an out. Well, it could have been a balloon, so I'm going to go to bed. I don't have to worry about it anymore. Because it could have been. And that's the part that irks me. Because it's like, look, why are people so scared that even though the evidence, like, you could murder their grandmothers in front of them and they still wouldn't admit it. You know what I mean? It's crazy. Oh, yeah. It's like, oh, I hear you. Oh, I got it, you. My yeah. cousin is married to a fighter pilot. Nice. Has he ever and seen I met, anything? I met him for the first time at my mother's funeral this summer. And he did not want to talk about it. Yeah. He finally opened up a little bit. He said, you know, I, I seen some lights, uh, you know, that didn't make sense, but I wouldn't call them UFOs or anything like that. I'm like, really? What, well, what would you call them? Ah, I don't know. I just, it was weird, but that's about it. You know, complete deflection of the entire subject. And it really made me wonder, okay, are you trained not to talk publicly about these? Okay, and if so, why? Mm -hmm. It's not like it, you, if you saw a UFO, that's that's not under national security. No, but you're you're you're. It's not trained, but you're taught through actions of your employers and your superiors that if you do talk about it, there'll be consequences. It's something that happens that is it's absolutely asinine, and the word asinine here is really it's the definition of this. That's something incredible was witnessed by a credible witness somebody who's hired professionally to do their jobs and if they come out and they say on a professional level that i've seen something that doesn't make sense over this area well we'll just remove you from the flights for going forward under further psychological and like this is the part where i get angry it's like we're past that point right with the amount of reports that are happening, they're still saying, well, maybe you're psychological. It's, I'll stab you with this pencil, I swear to God. Like It's almost at the point where it's, it's asinine the way people are treating this. They don't want to admit what's happening, regardless of how much evidence we got. It's daily 
globally, daily, somebody records something, there's some sort of event that happens. Activity on this planet isn't just periodical. It's daily, night and day around the sun. It doesn't matter. They're just, oh, it's like a beehive. And I mentioned this before, but if you're going to be doing this much activity, you're not coming from another star system just for one visit. You're you're operating in our system, either our solar system, our oceans, which is a great place to hide. You're somewhere. And now we're noticing them more with our radar because until 2004, when they upgraded the radar on the Nimitz, they didn't spot these things on radar before, but the new equipment spotted them. So our equipment's getting better. It's not that their activity is more numerous now. It's just we, we're catching them more now. We have the technology to see their activity more now than we ever did before. And more people are saying, yeah, and not only we're seeing visually, but all the sensors and equipment are also logging that this is actually happening. So we have scientific data now. And the scientists are, are jumping on board saying, look, we don't need the government to kickball this. Let's start doing it ourselves. And so we have the Scientific Coalition for UAP Studies and a lot of brilliant men and women donating their time and their massive intellect to uncover I, this. I agree, though. But the problem that we're seeing with a lot of this is all of these power groups, whether yeah. it's it's the SCU or whatever. OK, I thought the SCU looked really, really bad for a group of scientists who are brilliant when they came out and fully supported NASA's efforts in their report. To me, that was, it was, it broke my heart. It really broke my heart because, and trust me, you know, it didn't shatter it, okay? But on the UFO front, it broke my heart because I know a lot of people in, in the SCU, okay? And NASA is standing up there lying through their teeth about UAPs, not UFOs, UAPs, okay? And the SCU backed that report. They didn't ask a single question about what's in your closet. And I lost a lot of respect for that. Okay. And, and my friends who are in the SCU, they know how I feel. They know how I feel because they let down, they had an opportunity to make a statement for themselves and they screwed it up and they went corporate instead of doing what they're doing, which is what is right for science. What is right for the nuts and bolts? Yeah. And I thought that was garbage, Jason. I really thought that was a garbage move. Well, the thing is, NASA, I wasn't expecting anything from NASA. And when NASA came out and they're like, well, we don't really. I was like, well, of course. What was what, what were we expecting, right? NASA will never admit, like uh, Darcy Weir. Is it Darcy Weir? I believe uh, yeah. the, the video um, documentary maker. He's got great content. You could just watch his films and you'll know that NASA is lying through their teeth. There's no way that they can't see the activity of what's coming and going from our atmosphere. We know from their live feeds. So whenever anything weird seems to be happening, they start zooming in, they cut out the feed like, oh, technical difficulties. Conveniently, when something enters the screen that can't be identified. So right. NASA is NASA's a lost cause. And needs to be reminded that it is a lost cause, that the people don't have faith in NASA anymore. They're not there, right? They're not playing ball with us. And the military and the Air Force, again, in the United States, well, military is a little bit more forthcoming, but the Air Force is completely silent, hasn't said anything. We know the Air Force is so dirty in this, at, like their face is so covered in U UFO, it's unbelievable, right? It's like an 80s Coke scene where the guy's just covered in Coke from, you know, like one of those comedy movies. That's what they're covered in. They're, it's just, and they're not admitting anything. They're not admitting, they're omitting. As long as they stay silent, they don't need to say anything. They just say nothing, right? Yeah. You're not lying. You're just not saying anything. And, and, and this is where uh, I think, you, you're going to start seeing the witness testimonies, um, the whistleblowers coming out fighting against these establishments. Because even as uh, Tim Burchette said, he was talking to that major, that commander, and he was asking about the UAP 
stuff because they were just dancing circles around the issue and not telling him. And he flat on out that, said, not telling you. On that note, we got you for another half an hour. Jason Gilmet, the great host and researcher from UAP Studies Podcast. Make sure you add it to one of your favorites on Spotify and every major podcast platform. Spaced Out Radio continues with Jason right after this. Hey, sweet Robbie G. How you doing, buddy? And, uh, yeah. There we go. Hour. Man, half hours go by so fast, dude. I know. I know. Yeah, I've um, I reached out to um, James Fox because I wanted to have an update. Like, he's been on the freaking front lines of, like, in Washington and interviewing Burchette and asking really great questions at these hearings. And, uh, you know, Dude, I'm such a, a strong supporter of his. And I don't understand when he sleeps. Like, he's doing documentaries. He's on shows. Like, he's all over the place on different parts. like, dude, when do you sleep? Like, it's just 24-7, this guy. Uh, but, yeah, I'd like to get uh, get him back on and uh, just to see what he's been up to, right? Because the Virginia case, or Varginia case, uh, has also new developments in it. So I want to find out more information from that. And uh, that one's huge. Because it reflects a lot what Paul Hellyer was telling that the U.S. was doing with us, right? That they show up. They're the one who take the bodies and the craft and they go back stateside. And it's the same thing that happens in Canada. So, yeah, that's that's interesting. I'm going to find something for you here. See if I still have it. By the way, you got, like, some of the best listeners of any show like, I'm just watching all, like, you know, their, their commentary and stuff like that. They're all nice. Nobody's a butthole. You know what I mean? Like, everyone's so nice to each other. And Oh, I threw out the butthole earlier. Yeah. Or that's, somebody threw out the butthole earlier. There you go. But that's it. They, they stick together, which is which is awesome. You got a really good group there. Good for you. The Canadian way to do things. What, what's your email? Uh, UAP studies podcast at gmail.com hold on let me uh let me go here <clears throat> no can't have that one um and then my only fans <laughs> uh, my feet right. my feet aren't worth putting up there you know okay um oh, no i no hold on Hold on, Dave's hitting buttons that he doesn't know what he's doing right now. Hold on. Uh, forward. That's the one I wanted to forward to you. Okay, what's your email? Uh, UAP studies podcast at gmail.com. Email.com? At gmail.com. Yeah. Gmail. 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 Yeah. Gmail. Gmail. Yeah. Gmail. Yeah. Gmail. All right. So what I've sent to you, just so our audience knows I'm not keeping anything from them, is I asked Paul Hellyer back in 2019 a number of questions. And he said, I wasn't going to attempt to answer your questions because I don't know many of the answers and I really don't have time to comment. But in the spirit of Christmas, I will give you brief answers to your inquiries. Well, here's, the, <clears throat> here's the interesting part is number six. I am told that there is a group that occupies one floor of the National Research Council building. A former Mountie confirmed in writing that the RCMP were involved and inadvertently told him that Canada had been in touch with two alien species on the assumption that he was in the loop, but went mum as soon as they realized he wasn't. Huh. Yeah, see somebody really something out like that. I'd be like, mm -hmm, yeah, no, I totally know. I hang out with them like every weekend. Go ahead, keep keep talking. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, you don't tell them that you don't know what they're talking about. You just keep your mouth shut until you get more information. Yeah, well, let's go see them. I haven't seen them in a bit. I'm just gonna bring my cell phone with me just because, you know, how it Penny, is. Penny Van wants your uh, only fan. <laughs> <laughs> you want to see my feet? That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I've been making that joke quite a bit lately. Just uh, hey, my OnlyFans is this. Like, by crazy. the way, I've, I've checked out his OnlyFans, and his 
it, it's it's literally Jason's wife with a cheese grater going after his bunions and corns. Listen, it's bad. My feet are bad. I'm not gonna lie to you. You do uh, you'd be to some some crazy stuff, you know. Mm hmm. But yeah, no, Paul Hellyer was uh was an interesting guy. Plus, he didn't, you know, at first he got all these reports. He didn't care about them. He was trying to put the military back in order. And then when he finally read the day after Roswell, he realized all those reports he was getting, it was too late. He didn't get to them on time. The states had already gotten to them. And he was always the last to know after that. And then he realized he dropped the, uh -oh. he, he dropped the puck on that one. Oh, well, he dropped the puck on a lot of them, dude. No, it's just sad. Oh. Yeah, a we, lot could of had a, we could have had a more richer history in ufology had he been more adamant on it, right? An earlier yeah. age, I mean. Yeah, I hear you. Hey, big thank you to Darth, Lori, Simon, T-Bone, My Flock, and Deb for the Super Chats. Here we go. go with the second half of spaced out radio tonight my name is dave scott very much appreciate earning your listening ears reminder to all of you that if you have missed portions of this show or others you can check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio do me the favor hit that subscribe button you can find us on any major podcast network including spotify iHeartRadio, itunes and google play our website, spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read the news wire, check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and you can join our Space Travelers Club on Patreon. Here we go. UAP Studies podcast host Jason Gamet is with us until the top of the hour. We're talking UFOs over Canada. And Jason, some of the biggest stories that have happened on the north of the border include everybody knows Shag Harbor. Everybody knows Falcon Lake. But nobody talks about the Montreal lights that were seen from a hotel, the Prince George lights in British Columbia back in the 1970s, all of the crop circles that have appeared in the prairie provinces and in UFO sightings from there. Uh, UFO sightings all along the West Coast and East Coast of the oceans. We still don't know what's happening up in the Arctic, but, I mean, it's it's a little strange. I mean, there is enough there to try and create a serious UFO history, never mind the fact that there are multiple UFO sightings and reports uh, coming from every Great Lake that Canada touches. I mean, it just seems like... It's all over the place, but nobody really wants to talk about it or deal with it. How do we expose that? How do we get that out? What needs to be done in your opinion? I think it's it's legitimately having the issue with and discussion with people. Um, I'll give you an example. My 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 in laws are, are quite you know fundamental Christians, and so for me to broach a subject about UFOs or aliens is not really something they want to talk about it's uncomfortable we leave it it's off the table when you come over but recently my mother-in-law is like i had a dream about a ufo and i saw an alien like she'll start talking to me about it she's having dreams and it's more about just having the conversation of saying yeah and, and what if it's true what if this is what's happening i think it's a humbling pill because i think you know and i mentioned this to you before many times on our conversations over the phone but we're at the bottom of the totem pole when it comes down to intelligence here. Uh, a lot of people assume that if there's aliens, that somehow we're even to them, that we're going to meet on even terms and shake hands and say, how are you? It's not the way this is working at all. They have the upper hand. They're more intelligent, far more advanced than we are. And we have to admit that there's not, that's not going to change. That's facts. You know, that's science. That's just the way it works. But if we can admit that, we can now put our fears and our egos aside and learn. Learn their technology, maybe even learn the way that they live. I'm all ears, man. You know, I've seen the way that we've been running things for 
the last thousands and thousands of years. It's not working. It's bloody. Uh, people get hurt. It, it's it's not working. And if they're saying, look, you're not living properly, like, there's no bond. I mean, we uh, think about how much divide there is in the world today. And the divide is is for a reason that these, you know, we're being divided. It's purposefully made to keep us distracted and fighting amongst ourselves while something else, the elites or governments can just get away with what they're getting away with, which let's face it, they're blunt about it now over the news. You know what I mean? They look at many crimes. All these politicians are guilty and they investigate themselves, <coughs> Trudeau, um, and find themselves not guilty of anything. You know what I mean? So this is the problem that we have. We're, we're, we're too busy being divided and being squeezed as a middle class. You know, it's just constantly squeezing us for everything we got till we're losing our homes. Uh, you know, we can't afford groceries. We went down from a two car home to a one car home. Like these are legitimate problems that I'm dealing with. My family, your family are dealing with. Uh, the audience doesn't know this, but the conditions are poor in Canada right now. It's not good. Trudeau's got to go is my motto as far as I'm concerned, because it's true. Uh, and just an idea, Dave, I'm just throwing this out there. This is my opinion, not Dave's. But when Trudeau is out of power and is no longer prime minister, he should have his Canadian citizenship revoked and kicked out of the country for the disservice he's done to this country, for what he's done to us. I think that's only fair, right? I don't think he should get a pension, go straight to jail, don't pass go, right? Um, that's my opinion. But that's because of the state that we're in. And I never got political before, but I have to now because people like it's you and I are threatened. Well, we're threatened. Our program yeah. are threatened. Our free speech is threatened. I know Canada never had free speech to begin with, but what's recently been passed into law is ridiculous. And that includes the UFO subject. If they decide to shut that down, Canada's not talking about it. You know? And uh, the news is controlled by the by government now. Like, they approve what goes on and in, in what the Canadians can or cannot see. Again, this concerns me because any information that I want to get, I need to outsource. You know, I need to go to DuckDuckGo is a great place that does not follow the Canadian uh, new laws that, that went through. So if you're a Canadian, you want to get information that's that's good and not filtered through the Canadian government censorship, that's the place to go for anything UAP related as well. It's a good source. Yeah. How do you think this censorship law will affect the UFO subject? Well, it's like anything else. If you dictate to the people, you control the language, you control what is allowed, what's acceptable, not acceptable. You even put punishment, like there's punishments in place now. There's, I offend you. Just something I, I could say, you know, nice glasses and you're offended. You can slap me with the same charge as if I assaulted you with a baseball bat. Same charge. And I will be fined $25,000 for offending you. At any point in time, this was passed into law. And if you could do that by just being offended, how much more can you do that for censorship of in sensitive information? You know, oh, if you speak about it, well, it'll be a fine. Maybe we take your program away. You know, maybe you're not allowed to speak your nonsense anymore. This is the battle that we're facing in the future, not only on our side of the border, but on the U.S. side as well, because there has to be some pushback. There's no way these clandestine organizations have been at this since 1933 are just going to quit and run out of the shop. There's no way they're going to do that. They're still doing what they're doing. And unfortunately on being on Canadian side, it's just bad right now for what we want to put out as news. If they deem it's not news, you get shut down. So I hope that, you know, things change for us on this side of the border for sure. But I'm adamant it, you know, like uh, revoke his freaking citizenship. He's not allowed in Canada after this. I'm adamant on it. I'd vote on it. Start a petition. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Stomp a foot. Stomp, Stomp a, a foot. A bumble foot. That's what I'm going to do. Yeah. Stomp a skate blade right on, right on the Parliament Hill. Right yeah. there. I'm angry yeah. and I'm not taking it anymore. This, you know, yeah. revolt. Well, you know, it's like his dad said, Viva la Revolution. I go get yes. that one. Got you. He has one. Yeah. Yeah, the Americans won't get that. The Americans won't get it, but no. you got it. That's important. I got that. Yeah. I got that. You know, but 
on, on a serious side with the, with the idea that UFOs have been pushed down the totem pole, so to speak, on the political game because of everything that's going on. Do you see Dr. Mona Niemer's uh, group who is looking into gathering all of the statistics and the reports that have been gathered by all the alphabet agencies? Do you see that falling by the wayside? Because we're coming up to that point here where there was supposed to be an initial report released. Yeah, but haven't we already faced this? Like, haven't there been so many groups that said they were going to do this? Like, even Enigma Labs, like, they burned bright and then just faded out. Like, I have not heard anything of Enigma. Oh, they were supposed were to be the part. next. Yeah. There were there's... part between, behind the scenes. They just, well, okay, it, it hasn't I haven't heard anything. It hasn't been officially announced that they are the government's MUFON. Yeah, yeah. That's the part where I'm a little bit iffy about. It's like, they're not. And then the information that they get, you know, does it stay private to the government only? Is it available to all the general population? Um, and again, if you have a, an organization like NASA, why would NASA even contemplate looking at those as evidence? Why Why are they saying, well, we looked and we couldn't find anything? You're blind if you can't find anything. It's like putting your hands in, in a bucket of pin and needles and saying, I don't feel anything. It's impossible, impossible that NASA doesn't know. Impossible. So it means that they're blatantly lying. There's no, there's no, there's no out for them when it comes down to this. Well, we don't find anything. Really, really don't find anything. Okay. Uh, of all the cases that we have, that's not only low to the ground, there's physical evidence on the ground. You're telling me that NASA doesn't know about this, right? They can pinpoint a rock on Mars right we have three robots on mars but they can't solve that we're being visited by some sort of other technology that's not human that they have no evidence it's treating us like we're idiots like children you know yes. yeah and it's basically saying like you you've witnessed or experienced something and then somebody's going no you didn't you didn't see anything i know well, better than you but uh, you know it's insulting we, yeah and, and this is something i noticed with with and this isn't, I'm not being insultive of Ryan Graves or, or David Fravor or anybody like that, but we seem to have this new ufology out there, Jason, that that's covering both sides of the border. Okay. Where we are seeing all of these ex fighter pilots, scientists and, and uh, statisticians, mathematicians, all coming forward and basically taking the the ufo story and trying to make it their own like hey you people who've been studying ufos for years you go over there you mm -hmm. don't deserve to be a part of this conversation yeah. it doesn't matter whether you know it's somebody with a a pedigree in science like gary nolan who's on kind of on both sides of the ledger or you know even the late stanton friedman nobody brings him up anymore and look at the great work he did over the years legends yeah exactly major <coughs> legend and and it seems like you know with ryan graves i mean how he got burnt in the mexico conference after people in ufology were telling him stay away from jaime mosan stay away from that but he knew better he knew better because nobody from ufology is going to tell him what to do and he had egg on his face and I, I think part of the problem that we're having here is this story, doesn't matter whether it's in Canada or the U.S., it's become so political that we are seeing an incredible increase in this newfound ufology of nuts and bolts where the people who think they're in the know because they have a government top secret clearance or something along those lines are really trying to put a death knell to the people who are the grassroots researchers of this. Your thoughts? Yeah, and another aspect of it as well, and I totally agree with what you're saying, is that I, I see that happening. It's like, oh, I'm the new kid on the block, the new popular kid on the block. Um, the disclosure messiahs, as I like to call them, the people that are going to, you follow me, I know what's going on. Like, uh, There's a few of them out there. You guys sort them out for yourselves, which one you think it is. Uh, but it is it is an issue. And 
the biggest issue is how much money disclosure is going to bring. It's going to bring a lot. Um, People are going to sign off on exclusives. And, you know, you got News Nation, CNN, everybody's going to want to be first once this starts to really break news and it becomes mainstream. Keep in mind, this will be bigger than, you know, when Michael Jackson died, they played like Michael Jackson stuff on every station for two weeks. It was Michael Jackson this, Michael Jackson that, like it was nonstop. This will be the equivalent of that, but like 10 times more worse because people are going to find a clue in how far back it goes. People are like, you know, news agencies are going to start looking at Roswell and other cases and saying, well, actually, it's been happening the whole time. And we were always on board, which we all know they weren't. They're late to the party, um, but they're going to try to cash in on that because it gives them views. Right. So it's going to be limiting for you and I to be able to get a lot of these guests on because I can't compete with a twenty five thousand dollar offer from CNN to have somebody on on my podcast. Like, I just can't do that, right? It's impossible. So that's where I see the problem of this becoming more of a media circus at this point. It, it is a disclosure for dollars now. It, it, I true. love that. Disclosures for dollars. Love that. Like dialing for dollars, right? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And yeah, I love that. That's, that's what we're seeing. I mean, you take somebody like Ryan Graves, who has his own business for UFOs set up, on the fear mongering that these are a complete threat to United States airspace. And it's only a matter of time before we have a UFO versus uh airliner collision. That's going to cause mass casualties, which hasn't of, happened, which hasn't, hasn't happened, happened yet. No, no. I mean, th- but this is what we're dealing with. And as long as that fear mongering continues, what sells fear sells Fear creates a lot of zeros at the end of a one yeah. for budgets. Well, especially when it comes out to military complex, their sole purpose is to instill fear. So then Congress gives them more money for the defense budget. As we know, as Tim Burchett said, like every year, $1 billion of taxpayers' money disappears. Not accounted for, no paper trails, no nothing. This money is leaked two other programs so they're they're put under names of certain programs but then they're funneled to another program that's not on the books there's no oversight can't trace the money and he'd been doing that for decades right uh when was it ronald donald's uh, uh rumsfeld um when he said he looked into it the day before 9 11 and what did he say like two trillion or a ridiculous sum of money 2.3 2. trillion at that point how do you miss that much money? And I made this case before, Dave, but if I was the cartel and you misplace a million dollars of my money, what do you think I do to you? Yeah. Right? You need to tell me that you could misplace two point something trillion dollars and nothing happens. Nobody looks into it. It's just, okay, well, let's do better going forward. Like, this is what I mean. It's stupid. Anybody with, with reason or reasoning skills would look at this and go, what? How are you okay with this? How is this an answer to anything? It's not. They just don't talk about it anymore, and we just go on about our business. We do it to ourselves because we allow them to get away with this. We we condition ourselves. We teach them how to treat us, and we have taught them how to treat us over the last, how many, 75 years now? And another thing that I'd like to point out, the military and the CIA and all that, although they're about protecting the people of the United States, have done experiments very well documented on their own population and mind control, controlling votes, controlling swaying of emotions. They, they've done programs like this, and we trust them. We believe that they have our best interest in heart, that if there was such thing as a UFO program that they tell us, like it's it's us. I think our problem is it's us. We keep saying the government, but we're the ones in charge of the government. They're no longer serving the public. They're self-serving. And we, the public, are just letting them do it, right? So this whole UAP issue also falls into what we currently are socially in the world, like where we're at. Look at the West and look how we're all divided over here. Like, it's crazy. Not only Canada, but United States. Everybody's fighting. Everybody's a minority. Everybody needs to be catered to. We're all being divided and 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 stretched thin while other stuff is going on that favors people that are a little bit more richer than us 
or more politically upscale than us. So that's the biggest problem. I think that the UFO issue in our social situation is equally tied. We want disclosure, but at the same time, we want things to be better. We want them to tell us the truth about UFOs, but at the same time, we want them to freaking do their jobs and make things better. So it's a complex time. Very complex time. On a Canadian scale, over the next, say, 24 months, do we see anything coming out regarding the UFO story up north? Do you see it being combined with what may happen in the south with the new with the new budget that'll be coming out? Oh, man, I hope so. Uh, between you and me, Dave, I really hope so. Uh, with the momentum that is taking place down south, and there are leaders that we need to support, like Tim Burchett and his team and uh, James Fox and his team, like support these people. They're on the front lines. Same with Ross Coulthard and um, uh, you know David Grush. These people need our support now more than ever and not to be attacked or anything like that, but to, to show that we're appreciative that they're willing to do this. Um, David Grush's life and his family's life got threatened, but it didn't stop the other 30 plus whistleblowers from stepping forward. And I think that's the momentum. I think the whistleblowers is where disclosure comes from. It's never going to be admitted by the government. The president of the United States is never going to know. But it's the men and women coming forward testifying that is going to educate the general population. It's going to become just general knowledge to us that this is true because of these leaks. We won't need the government to say, to give us answers, because we know at this point that the government won't, because either it can't or it's incompetent. Um, and either outcome is devastating for us. But yeah, I think this comes through social consciousness. I think it's come through all of us talking about and say, look, this is happening to us. Let's just face it, talk about it. How, what what do we do as citizens of this world about this, right? Don't need the government. Don't need the military. What do we do? And can we initiate contact? That'd be great, Dave, wouldn't it? If we can actually be the ones to initiate contact with these things and don't need the military or the government to represent us because I think that would not be good. But, you know, I... I Give people a chance. Outsource. <laughs> no, and, and I agree, because the one thing that we do know for sure is we can't rely on the idea that aliens landing on the White House lawn or mm. on the uh, front steps of uh, of the Canadian Parliament buildings isn't going to happen. We know that's not going to happen, and we know that we have to be able to look at other avenues and study other avenues and keep that grassroots level going. Keep the, you know, if somebody starts to go political, put them on the other page. Yeah. You know, turn yeah. the page on them. Right. And, and that's really the, the way it has to go because I'm still a firm believer as we got about just over 90 seconds left, Jason, I'm still a firm believer that the grassroots level is going to pick up again, and it is going to play an extremely important part moving this ball forward. 100%. It, it, it falls down to us. Um, to and look at what we're doing. You know, we're we're talking we're every day with people about this. People are again educated on this at the same time as we are. Uh, it serves a purpose and it's going somewhere. It's being this concept, this idea, and openness to our visitors is now more common than we think. And it's just up to us, every one of us, to address this. Talk with coworkers about it during your lunch break, or ask your in laws like what are your thoughts on it. Like open the discussion. And then talk about what's being put out there. What what do we know? Uh, what are facts at this point? And as a family, just follow up on it. That's all you can do. I educate my kids on this stuff all the time. I think it's important for them to know. And that's it. Just educate the people around you. That's all you have to do. Jason, thank you for coming on Spaced Out Radio again, my man. Hey, it's been such a good here. opportunity to chat with you and uh, and uh, your great knowledge that you bring to the table. Tell everybody where they can find UAP Studies Podcast. Well, so UAP Studies Podcast is uh, currently on Spotify. We did open a new Patreon account, and a uh, YouTube is being a uh, new account is being reinstalled uh, as of October fifteenth. We're doing a relaunch. Uh, it'll be available on there. And for anybody who followed us on Apple, we are going to go back on Apple soon. So hang in there. But pretty much wherever your podcast provider is, uh, UAP Studies Podcast should be on there.
That is great, man. And good luck to you as you're uh, re- doing some restructuring there. We uh, greatly appreciate you taking the time. And, of course, we'll get you on before the end of the year to kind of help wrap up the year that was, man. Love it. Jason Gamet, everybody from UAPstudiespodcast.com. Now, coming up next in hour number three, Steve Stockton talks about a couple of weird stories. Then little Timmy Senor is going to join us for the UFO report, a jam-packed hour three next of the Mighty SOR. Stay tuned. Great job tonight, buddy. <coughs> hey, my friend, it's always a pleasure to come on your podcast man, or on your show too, right? Like it's, uh, it truly is. It's it's fun to talk, talk you at bees or just hang out. So yeah, thank you. It's uh, my pleasure. No problem, buddy. No problem. Anytime. All and, right. Uh, I'll give you a call on Saturday when I'm in town. So perfect. Yes. Uh, send me a text. I have family coming down Saturday, but it should be later in the day. So if you're around like, you know, 1, 2 p.m., I should be able to go out there and yeah. come pay you a visit. I'll, I'll give you a call. Awesome, bro. Later. Take care. Bye-bye. All right, Jason, go met. I'm going to step away for a minute. You guys stick around. Big Hour 3 coming up next. All right. 
thank you tonight, guys, to Mike Rivers, Lord William, Darth, Lori, Simon, T-Bone, My Flock, and Deb for the great Super Chats. Anybody new who hit subscribe and rang that bell tonight, very much appreciate the love, guys. Really helps out. Don't forget you can do some shopping at spacedoutradio.com. Because we got great swag, and it's not ugly. Definitely not ugly swag. I guarantee it. <coughs> hmm. Jason was great tonight. He really was. Hopefully I can meet up with him this weekend. Little Timmy Senor sitting in the blackness. Don't worry, though. His, he brushed his teeth right before the show, so his teeth are going to shine bright. Insidious Rage, welcome to SOR chat. We got about 30 seconds here. Don't forget, if you haven't already, join the crowd at the SOR Space Travelers Club on Patreon. It's a great way to support what we do on this show on a nightly basis. So thank you. As low as five bucks a month, guys. Five bucks. You can do it. I promise you, you can. All right. Here we go, everybody. We got like uh, seven seconds. Would you like to connect with us? Head to spacedoutradio.com for all your latest show info. Now, back to Dave Scott and SOR. Third and final hour of Spaced Out Radio is now underway. Always appreciate you joining us. My name is Dave Scott. Very much thanking you for tuning us on in. Hello to everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America, digitally on Odyssey Radio, Talk Stream Live and kpnl all of our archives are free join us at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio do me the favor hit that subscribe button the desert clam has set the password for tonight in the sor space travelers club we sand we sand is your password use it wisely space travelers as the clam sets the password each and every night right here on spaced out radio our website, spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to body uh, to Bumblefoot, read the news wire, check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and you can join us on Patreon in the SOR Space Travelers Club. It is that time of the night where we say hello to Steve Stockton from the YouTube channel Among the Missing for another strange story. Hello, friends. Welcome to Among the Missing YouTube channel on Spaced Out Radio. I'm Steve Stockton, and I'm about to take you on an unbelievable journey of people just like you. Their stories and encounters will haunt us on Among the Missing. Gabriel Nagy, a married father of two from Sydney, Australia, called his wife on January 21, 1987, to inform her that he would be arriving home from work for lunch earlier than usual. However, he never made it and disappeared for nearly 25 years after that phone call. According to the Australian, his burnt car was found alongside a road the next day. Many presumed he met his demise shortly after the phone call, whether due to foul play, self-harm, or strange and unfortunate events. Since it was out of character for him to go anywhere without informing his family, local authorities initiated an investigation to locate him. Several weeks later, a lead emerged when Gabriel resurfaced briefly to withdraw funds from his bank account. The investigators followed the trail to a store in Newcastle, 
where Gabriel had bought camping equipment. Unfortunately, the case went unsolved from that point on. The family was left with nothing but unanswered questions and sorrow as there were no further leads to pursue. No signs of Gabriel emerged for the next two decades, and his wife and children set out to have him declared legally deceased. But before that could happen, a police officer checked public records to see if anything might turn up, and to their surprise, it did. In 2010, Detective Georgia Robinson achieved a significant milestone in the cold case investigation of Gabriel's suspected demise. She stumbled upon a Medicare card, possibly linked to Gabriel, and traced it back to its owner. Upon the police arrival at the man's residence, he was perplexed. It was later discovered that he was the individual who had gone missing in January 1987. Gabriel affirmed that he could not recall his previous life with a wife and children. Nevertheless, Gabriel utilized police archives containing family photographs to aid in triggering his memory and reconstructing a chronology of his former existence. After the phone call to his wife in 1987, Gabriel's earliest memory was of waking up with a severe head injury that was bleeding. From that point on, his memories were unclear. However, he recollected camping in different parts of Queensland, working on farms and fishing boats, and sleeping on the streets until a pastor brought him on as a caretaker. It remains unclear whether his memory loss was due to a physical assault or a car accident that led to dissociative fugue, which his family suspects may be the cause. Gabriel ultimately reunited with his loved ones, but they decide to let him piece his life back together slowly because of his memory loss. Despite living separately, Gabriel continues to chat with his wife and grown children. Gabriel's case is undoubtedly one of the most fascinating of recent times. Next up, the story of Philip Cesarigo. Philip Cesarigo was once known as a man with a knack for making enemies. He tried to join the elite Special Air Services, or SAS, Special Forces Unit of the British Army, but failed to pass the selection course twice. While participating in the endurance exercise, which involved marching over 40 miles across the Brecon Beacons in Wales in less than 24 hours, he injured his knee and could not continue. He tried again after recovering from his injury, but failed a second time. It was the end of a fantasy he had held since he was a young man. His daughter disclosed that the rejection had plunged him into a, quote, fantasy state, end quote, causing him to emulate the dressing style of SAS soldiers and drink in places where they were known to gather. And thank you to Steve Stockton from Among the Missing for another great story from Among the Missing. And that was a weird one. Don't usually hear them coming back. But nonetheless, we move on. As you, If you want Steve's stories and you want more of those, head over to youtube.com forward slash Among the Missing, and you can pick out some really cool stories right there. All right, from the mysterious to the weird, strange, and ufological. Here's little Timmy Senor and the UFO Report. Nobody's gonna know. They're gonna know. you say there tim senor we can barely see you because you're all blacked out you know you you don't really work during the day so i mean you could you you know you could go to the hardware store and get some new light bulbs yeah well these are special city lights i use in here that don't bounce around as you know my little studio is uh under the stairs and it's tiny so i have to use uh low heat emitting lights and so i'm waiting for them to get here in the meantime you guys have me in the dark yeah it's a scary scary time it adds it's... to the ambiance you know what i'm saying yeah it i popped the, the cap on so you guys could get a, an idea where i am i'm here i promise i'm just stuck using my uh ambient lights as my main light well, let me put a hat on to join you oh look at that and- it is that time of the night where we always say <laughs> hello to all the agents and agencies that are tuning us on in tonight. And, you know, you already have our phone number, you, so we don't need to give it to you. You know, call us sometime. Say hello. Some of us can be bought. That's right. 
That's right. So what do you say, Tim? I mean, how's the UFO world lately? Uh, things are happening. Definitely tumultuous times. We recently had another video from a little inside look to David Grush, and we talked about the Yes uh, podcast and a little bit of the insight that we took from that. We definitely have a lot to look forward to over the next few months, potentially some more whistleblower hearings coming forward. But for now, it seems like there's a lot of conflict of interest. And we briefly touched on this on Monday, but the Liberation Times has a great new article that discusses this exact topic. So the congressional UFO language debate and UFOs, Washington's web of conflict and interest over UFOs. So Christopher Sharp is bringing us this new article on the complexity, conflicts, and grave national security concerns coming from UFO language, which could be included within the 2024 National Defense Authorization Act. And it has created alleged divisions among the executive branch colleagues in Washington, D.C. And so it may have some of these apparent divisions stemming from conflicts of interest. And so firstly, we could bring forward potentially a look at Lloyd Austin, U.S. Secretary of Defense. And as reported by journalist Michael Schellenberger earlier this week, within the publication known as Public, sources have alleged that Austin is attempting to undermine a UFO amendment that is included in the draft of NDAA legislation. And so now this has been confirmed through sources and Liberation Times that these aforementioned allegations are indeed true and correct. And so being a former board member of defense contractor Raytheon Technologies, this may have at least partially influenced his need to express concerns over the Schumer Amendment. And so before we go any deeper, let's briefly just talk about this and this topic and this situation. Dave, do you feel like in this situation, this specifically is a conflict of interest with Lloyd Austin? Oh, I, I don't know if it's a conflict of interest, you know, but it, but it is interesting to see how it's going to play out. One of the things that I always love is when the government gets into these language debates. This is where they try and pull all of these fancy words that nobody in the English language actually uses in order to screw people up and get their, their positions uh, pushed forward and that's their right. narratives pushed forward. Okay, I think that's the more dangerous side of it all right now because as we see UFOs become a lot more political, and put a lot more strain on the entire subject and the phenomena, I think that, you know, the way they're going to continue, you know, playing around with language. Tim, they were doing this two years ago. How many offices have we had? I mean, from OSAP to ATIP to, to the UAPTF to Aero and everyone in between. How many offices do you really need? If, if you can't get it right the first time or expand on the first one, why are they wasting money with this? And that's, that's all it is, is po political jargon that's going to screw everybody up. That's my opinion on it. And I think you're oh so right. And it's more of passing the buck that we've seen politically on this topic. And you know that we call this eupholetics around here for a good reason, because no matter how you slice it, this topic is being used as a tool politically. And so the Schumer Amendment would grant the U.S. government the power to eminent domain over materials and biologics of non-human and unknown origin, potentially held by defense contractors. And setting aside his former direct ties with Raytheon, Austin allegedly fears such language if passed into law, and it could jeopardize national security in his thoughts so where well, every, did this... see this is the crap about it mm -hmm. everything jeopardizes national security everything you know no it's, you're absolutely right it's ridiculous the fear mongering that continues around this subject on a political agenda is i mean we shouldn't even be surprised by it tim 
we really shouldn't be surprised by it. You know, I mean, what we really need to do right now is we need to, like, like I said with Jason, we got to get back to the grassroots of this story. Stop giving the politicians their, their duties start or their stop giving them the attention regarding this subject. They're not bringing anything out. I don't care if, if the next budget goes through or Schumer's act or whatever the hell it's called. Okay. It's not going to make a difference because lo and behold, the military industrial complex will always find a loophole in order to get around it. And that loophole it's national security. We can't do it. Yep. Yep. You bring up a great point and they've hidden behind such things as classification, for example, for a very long time. And so we know that at the source, this information is deemed classified at one level or another. So it sta- it has remained out of the purview of the people that are studying the topic or reporting on the topic or are even in the need to know at this point. So they've hidden it behind a wall of secrecy through classification. And I know at one point that was a big push. And we had Susan Go even talking on this topic, but that seems to have been pushed to the wayside. As we see now, it looks very much like even Joe Biden is putting together an organization under which they will be responsible to report directly to him on this topic. And their their feet would be held to the fire on this. Now, how it's handled by the certain um, representatives and the members of the cabinet and advisory committee that are working around on this subject will definitely keep it silent. And we know we won't get anything publicly. However, we do know that there's a lot of people that are interested on this topic being reported in a very real way. And UAP disclosure or UFO disclosure, I think, has kind of reached a new level. And I think we can thank maybe even David Grush and his bold statements for that, because we know it at least pushed a lot of people into feeling responsible for that information. And perhaps the fact that he mentioned secret spending and secret programs, again, is a very subtle, quote-unquote, threat to the people in Congress that have the information to look a little bit deeper into their own backgrounds and closets. What do you think of that, Dave? Well, I think, I think the, well, the, the fancy list of names that David Grush uh, says he will provide Congress if he hasn't already. Okay. Is a list that we will never see. We have to be, you know, cognizant of that fact. And, we're probably never going to know who those names are either, even if they were brought out in public, Tim. Right. Right. I mean, but I mean, uh, I think with, with, with Grush, he's doing all that he can with the positioning that he has. Okay. And I don't think it's a surprise either. And none of us should be really surprised that all of a sudden he's teamed up with Jesse Michaels and the guys from, uh, the the Yes channel, or I forget what it's called on YouTube, yeah. that just did the one-hour documentary. Well, mm-hmm. Jesse Michaels, who's he tied to? Peter Thiel. Who's Peter Thiel tied to? Enigma Labs. Silently pulling the strings. It's very ominous. Yeah. Well, here's very, the thing. Very ominous. If, if Austin in this article is opposed to transparency, then that raises questions about the oversight of the Pentagon's UAP office known as Arrow, which is led by his deputy, Kathleen Hicks. Now, while the Arrow's director, Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick, searches for alleged UAP programs, it appears that those at the highest levels of government, such as Austin and Sullivan, have already been made aware And so in addition to the defense establishment component, there's the intelligence community component relating to the potential conflicts of interest and the lack of transparency. And so I absolutely agree here that it is unclear whether the current principal deputy director of national intelligence, Stacey Dixon, poses the same, possesses rather the same knowledge, but um, 
you know, Dixon has stipulated in previous NDA legislation that it's meant to play an oversight role over Arrow. So, you know, they want to be, she wants to be involved. And so we'll see what happens. But as you said, it's, it's become very political, very political. And the fact is, it seems like they are really fighting against transparency. And the last thing they want is for some whistleblower to come out publicly and drop a piece of information that can't be recanted. Well, I mean, look, the one thing that we've learned through this entire UFO subject, as political as it's gone the last four or five years especially, is the minute a politician talks about transparency with this topic, we know there's there's it's going right back behind closed doors. We've heard that now in the three last uh, hearings that we've had. Okay, I can't tell you that. We could talk behind closed doors about this. We could talk behind closed doors about that. Whistleblowers not going public. We could talk behind closed doors. Everything's closed doors. Well, what's the point of continuing this discussion publicly if it's not going to become public with what they're saying? Right, exactly. Okay. And, like, and, and I will reiterate I do when I say those words, I do understand that some of those whistleblowers, okay, cannot for their own safety and their previous or or current mission safe uh, can uh, the safety of the current missions cannot come out. I get that. I can appreciate that. All right. The last thing you would want is to be involved in a seriously important uh, top secret mission and you're outed over a UFO. You don't want that. I get the national security part. Right. Not but, everyone. Not everyone. Right. But the frustrating thing is, is that we're seeing that even the ICIG is being um, very uh, dodgy, I guess you could say, because it's still unclear why the ICIG is being so cautious in even confirming its active investigations into UFO invest into UAP programs and UFOs. Right. They're not even admitting that they're investigating it, yet they're being they're asking for information and they're also being held responsible for information. So that is incredibly frustrating to say that they're trying to be transparent in the same sentence as not even confirming that they have active investigations going on. I mean, how can you confirm if there's secret UAP programs if you're not looking into it? Right. That's frustrating. Or you have a large military base like Wright Patterson who has a lot of pull in your voting area that makes you all of a sudden have a conversation with them saying, yeah, let's get this UFO stuff back under the table. We don't need it public anymore. We're getting pissed off about this. Yeah. Remember we got 25,000 people working here and they all vote for somebody. Right. Right. Well, consider also that Stephanie O'Sullivan um, used to work for the CIA uh, previously, and now um, she's in a very pivotal role, and um, she's absolutely denying UAP programs to Senator Rubio publicly, and um, O'Sullivan uh, you know, was deputy director of CIA's Directorate of Science and Technology before becoming the agency's associate deputy director. Director, excuse me. So, you can take from that that the CIA may play a key role in any alleged crash retrieval program, and could look to exploit any UAP technology for its own use, and potentially deny any knowledge within the same sentence and that traditionally has been what we've seen and for somebody so well trained in the cia to boldly just go forward and say that we know nothing about this i think takes somebody very well trained but is also not set up for a transparent situation when you know this person's history in cia do you agree with that statement i, I would totally agree with you totally agree with you on that and i'm going to keep my answer short tim 
because mm. we do have to go to our break here at the bottom of the hour. When we return on the UFO report with our good friend, little Timmy Senor, a resident Timbit, UFO investigator behind Alien Ship Report says ghosts and ET dimensions exist. Oh, that's some seriously good woo. And how about over 100 sightings of UFOs reported across DMV this year as Congress and NASA push for more research. Tim Senor's UFO report on Spaced Out Radio continues right after this. Stay tuned. All right, buddy, we're clear. Sweet. Sweet, sweet. Good yeah. job. I still Good haven't job. kicked this cold that I have. I don't know if you can hear it in my voice. I'm still kind of scratchy. Oh, we still like you. <laughs> Man, I can't believe how close the uh, SOR party is. Yeah, look at this. It's Random. So There's close. many What's secret UAP programs. None of them are alien because yeah. UAPs are not UFOs, people. Yep. yep. That's from a random guy himself. RG knows. That's RG knows. Yep. From the mouth of babes. Hmm. You know, we're <laughs> gonna have to we're gonna have to uh uh somehow over the next little bit go pay that RG a visit. I want to check out the sphere. Go see you too. Yeah, that'd be good. Now, if they did Pink Floyd's The Wall, that'd be excellent. Yeah. Live. Live concert in the sphere. Forget about it. Mm-hmm. It just feels like something's going to go wrong, right? It's the sphere. It's Probably like asking for trouble. It's like no the beginning to a horror movie. All of those cameras and all that technology made in Montreal. Is it? Oh, that's interesting. So something's yeah. bound to go wrong. You know, as Canadians, everything will be like backwards. Are you guys metric? You went there, eh? Well, you're metric, right? And we're not. Very true. This is all I'm saying. <laughs> RG says all the employees are quitting the sphere. That tells you something. bad air conditioning who knows it would still be cool to go see a concert there sam sheeran says the wall would be good there so good mm -hmm. anything pink floyd anything pink floyd Did i ever tell you i had 19th row on the floor for the 30th anniversary of the wall oh wow. in vancouver it oh my been epic it was one of the greatest things i've ever seen in my life jeremy yeah. jones look at this rg ripped ass in the sphere and it, <laughs> it tore a hole in it i wonder whose fault that was i heard about that no i'm just yeah kidding. that was rg right there jj shredding rg like it mm-hmm bringing the heat yep That is such a great saying, ripped ass. <laughs> I don't know why. That just kills me every time I see, read it or hear it. It's perfect. You know, there was actually a brand new study telling you the perfect diet for the stinkiest of toots. There's a diet you can have. They tell you the perfect recipe for horrible toots. I don't condone that. But you know it's vegan. Of course it is. <laughs> it involves tofu, for sure. Oh, I'm never going there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. When RG's in the chat, it's always interesting. You never know where he's going. You don't. How many yep. old fashions has he had? Mm-hmm. I love it. Yep. Yep. When he builds up the excitement, that old hair lip just keeps on yapping. 
Oh, hairy lip. I bet you he could grow a hell of a mustache. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But it's ginger, so you'd never really notice it, right? Well, I think if he went thick, thick like Chuck Norris, I think it would work well. Hmm. Thank you tonight to Mike, Lord William, Darth, Debster, My Flock, T Bone, Simon, and Lori for the great super chats tonight. Very much appreciate the love. <clears throat> also, you can get your random guy swag at spacedoutradio.com. Even random guy likes wearing his own his own stuff. He does. He does. He totally does. Yeah. We don't have ugly swag. That's what I like. That's my sales pitch for it. We don't have ugly swag. You can get an anonymous Rex shirt there now. Absolutely. Here we go, everyone. Final half hour of Spaced Out Radio is now on the way. Spaced Out Radio continues. My name is Dave Scott, your host with the most tinfoil. I want to remind all of you that if you've missed portions of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website, spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read the newswire, check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and you can join our Space Travelers Club on Patreon. All right, we continue on with Tim Senor and the UFO report here on Spaced Out Radio. And there's a UFO investigator saying that ET dimensions and ghosts exist. What's all this about? Yeah, good stuff coming from Leslie Keen's work on near-death experiences and It's a new inspired Netflix series. And so now she's saying that there's a paranormal side of UFO reports connected potentially to ghosts and the supernatural. So the trailblazing UFO investigator who uncovered the U.S. whistleblower's claims over a captured alien craft has now linked human ghosts to extraterrestrials. Author Leslie Keen says there's a growing anecdotal evidence of an alternate dimension where both mystery and phenomena collide. Leslie told podcaster Chris Leto that she's increasingly sure that there's a connection between the supernatural, near-death experiences, and unexplained UFO sightings. She says in a quote that the paranormal elements of the UFO phenomenon seem to have some relationship to what people describe in a near-death experience. And it's a further extraordinary claim from Leslie, who broke the story of a whistleblower who said that the U.S. government has craft of non-human origin in a secret facility. And so her latest claims carry further weight due to her extensive work on near-death experiences. Her book, Surviving Death, has spawned a Netflix series on experiences of dying. Leslie adds that there's a paranormal, mysterious, and complicated side of UFO reports that may be connected to ghosts and the supernatural. And so she told Chris Leto that, in a quote here, there's some kind of crossover there, and I don't know what it is. There is the whole component of UFOs, which is just purely physical. They're on a radar. And that's the way the military approaches them. But then there's this other level that the UFO phenomenon has that's way more paranormal, mysterious, and complicated. Its impact on people is very important, and that's the element that she discusses. She believes that there could be some alternate dimension where all these phenomena are all tied together. In a quote, she says, it's a big mystery how it all holds together. 
but she says, I may have something to do with some kind of, I'm sorry, it may have something to do with some kind of dimension in which all these things dwell. Not That's not our dimension, and that's perceived by our five senses, but some other type of dimension that may overlap in some way. So she says, it's a shame that the entire area of the paranormal got a bad reputation because there's so many fraudsters that got involved. And similarly, the number of hoax UFO sightings has led scientists into not taking reports as seriously as they should. But in that case where a huge UFO is spotted from the ground by pilot Steve Allen, who saw the object being pursued by two fighter jets before it shot off at a speed that he estimated at around 3,000 miles per hour. She says, I don't know if it was a biblical experience or somebody from a different universe or whatever, but it was definitely not from around these parts. So Dave, Leslie Keen, getting into the woo, you know, she may not publicize it and put it into her writing and put it in publications, but maybe some of her books and behind the scenes and some of her thoughts, she is deeply into some theories of the woo. And maybe that's not a bad thing. Your thoughts. I, I think it's a good thing. I really do. Because somebody like Leslie Kane has the, the name and the stature to pull off bringing publicity to this subject. Okay. What I don't like about it is Remember when we were talking about the different classes of ufology where the grassroots level is being pushed to the side and all these new politician type of ufologists, military type of ufologists are coming in and basically telling everybody, get out of the way. Yeah, shoo, shoo. Okay. I can tell you right now, this isn't a new story. It's not new whatsoever. Incredible researchers like David Weatherly, Joshua Cutchin, Timothy Renner, okay, John Tenney, just to name a few, have been looking into the tie-in of the phenomena for decades, for years. Okay, this is nothing new that people are, I mean, you've heard us talk about it all the time. The entire phenomena is interconnected. But because Leslie Kane says it, now it has legs on the story? I'm sorry. I'm not buying that. Okay? And the problem is that she'll get credit for it. Whereas all of these incredible researchers who've been busting their asses for decades are going to get shut out of the attention. I don't like that part. Yeah. Well, All right. give give this a moment of consideration because she does give credit where credit is due. And in a quote, she says that at the moment, UFO research is being taken more seriously than it has in decades. But the scientific inquiry into life after death is being almost ignored. And she says that I think people should know that the Bigelow Institute for Consciousness Studies uh, which was founded by Robert Bigelow is doing investigations into all of these questions and that the Institute launched an essay uh, competition, in fact, to people that had near-death experiences looking for people that um, were motivated to share their fascinating evidence and experiences. And so I think that, you know, she does give a little bit of credit to the people that are doing the research. And we both know Robert Bigelow takes this very seriously and has looked into it for quite a long time. But well, Leslie um, Kane, let, let me stop you right there because yeah. thanks thanks to her relationship with Bud Hopkins, Leslie Kane has had the inside scoop to people like Robert Bigelow for a long, long time. All right. And yet, if you go back to Johns Hopkins University and their famous medical uh, field for their research and study. There's a doctor there, a neurosurgeon named Eben Alexander, Dr. Eben Alexander, mm -hmm. who literally suffered a near-death experience after a bacterial infection from meningitis put him into a coma. 
Now, this is a guy didn't believe in this crap, shot it all down, had his own near-death experience, and is now a major proponent of studying the near-death experience. Even wrote a book about it. He's trying to get things peer-reviewed. Why isn't that mentioned? Okay, it always, it, not, this whole field seems to revolve still around Robert Bigelow. There are other people doing great work that are not getting the recognition that they deserve. And look, I, I think Leslie Keene does great work. I think she does thorough work. She really does. And she's tied in to a group of people that the majority of us in this field are jealous of, myself included. Okay. But at some point, these people, whether it's her, whether it's Ryan Graves, whether it's Rich Hoffman or whoever it may be, they have to start looking into the fact that they're not the first ones looking into this. They're not the first ones to tie everything together. This has already been done. And the people who have done it over the years deserve the recognition for their hard work. That's all I'm saying, man. Your mic's on mute. Oh, thanks. Um, well, do you think that she's circling around some truth here, potentially, and, and kind of putting it out in a public yes. way? Um, and she what's your opinion? I mean, so I love that she's talking about this because, I mean, I kind of came to the same conclusion. It seems like there's, an, there's it's all linked. Um, before we switch topics, could you just maybe briefly give your opinion of how they could potentially all be linked? And is it multi-dimensional? And is it a human spirit? Like, is it ghost? What's what's the connection between UFO and ghosts? Here, here's my thing on the phenomena. And people may call me crazy or whatever. I think the phenomena is godly. I don't know if it's God, but it's godly. And I remember having long in-depth conversations about the phenomena with Nicole Sackage about this. And the one one of the things that we discussed regarding the phenomena is how the phenomena can play with you. It can be show you amazing things, but it can also terrorize you at the same time. The phenomena seems to give you what you can handle at that moment, even if you're not prepared for it. It's very godly that way. Hmm. And I don't understand how it works. Okay. It's the same thing, Tim, where people who are in a forest who have a Sasquatch encounter get scared, run out of the forest. They drive in their vehicle. And the next thing they know, there's a UFO hovering over their their vehicle. Why is that? How did that happen? How did that happen? Why did the phenomena cause that? Okay. It happens because we aren't, the majority of people out there are not studying the entire aspect. They want to break them off into separate subsections, whether it's near-death experiences or UFOs or, I mean, hell, the, the U.S. government, Lou Elizondo alone, did a great job at separating UFOs from aliens. That's impossible. And they accomplished it. Right. Okay. So the phenomena is, is everything, in my opinion. It's, it's everything from the air that we breathe to the UFOs that people don't want to believe. It's absolutely everything. I like that. I like that. And it's an all encompassing answer and it seems to work. I mean, definitely. I, I find that a very comfortable answer to slip into. Um, yeah, that's great. I love that. Mm -hmm. Hey, I don't. And, and you know what? I am a firm believer, Tim, that there's a lot of these secrets that we will never find the answers to because the phenomena will only take us so far before it drops us like a shrinking violet. Mm. Poetry. 
Mm-hmm. All right. Final story of the night. A bunch of UFOs that were seen. What's going on here? Oh, yeah. More than 100 UFO sightings reported across uh, the Washington and that uh, eastern seaboard this year as Congress and NASA push for more research. And so this is a new headline coming from Fox. Washington. More than 100 sightings of UFOs have been reported across Washington, Maryland, and Virginia, according to the data from the National UFO Reporting Center, or NUFORC as we know them. Since the beginning of 2023, just three sightings were reported in D.C., while 42 were reported in Maryland and 70 in Virginia. Now, these sightings around the region may vary in description, shape, and form, but the most common was a round orb or sphere shape. So the most recent reports came out of Richmond, Virginia, and Harold, Maryland, at the beginning of September, and they were reported as lights and orbs. So in total, more than 4,600 sightings have been reported in D.C., Maryland, and Virginia since the agency began collecting the data, with some dating back as early as 1945, posted, of course, retroactively. Now, there has been some heightened interest in UFOs this year, or UAP as they're now being labeled, the broader term, and they cannot immediately be identified as known human-made or natural phenomenon. So in September, NASA published the findings of its long independent study into past UAP sightings, as we know. And the 33-page report stated that there is no evidence of any previously reported UAP sightings. And at least the ones that were reported are not extraterrestrial in origin. And they noted that there are so few high-quality observations that no scientific conclusions can be drawn. And we've covered NASA in this report pretty heavily on this show. Now, we know that they say that the study of UFOs will require new scientific techniques, including advanced satellites, as well as a shift into how to identify these objects. So, Dave, we do know that um, at this point, there have been quite a f- quite a few reports that they are going to be considering in their new effort to provide the public with more information on the government research and findings into UAPs. But the, de- the Department of Defense launched a new website with the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, Arrow, and DOD officials say reports, transcripts, press releases, videos, and photos associated with resolved UAP cases will be released as they are declassified and approved at that website. So more than 3,000 sightings have been reported across the U.S. this year, and according to the UFO database New Fork, they're going to be made public on that website. So transparency, more look into some eastern seaboard numbers that seem like they can't immediately be identified or considered a known human made or natural phenomenon. So that's kind of a big deal. You know, there's some big numbers for this for this year. So are you hopeful that this will get reported properly to Arrow and they give these real numbers across as unknown? Well, I don't believe Arrow will give any straight numbers. I don't think anybody should believe that Arrow is going to play ball with the public on this subject. Sean Kirkpatrick has already proven that. Okay, it's the same thing as giving your statistics to Enigma Labs. Don't do it. We'll never see the statistics. And if we do, they're probably going to be made up one way or another. Okay, so, I mean, let's get back to the 100 sightings on the East Coast of the United States. That's not a lot, Tim. That's not a lot whatsoever. It's an interesting number. (laughs) But you consider how many millions of people live along the East Coast. And to only have 100 people or 100 sightings reported, 
I mean, it's great. The fact that they are being reported is great. Okay, but don't you say there's only 100 of them? It sounds like a big number, but in reality, with the millions of people who live there, it's really not. Right, with only three over Washington, D.C. That's a low number, in my opinion. But now, is that because people aren't reporting to New Fork or people not reporting? It's very curious why those numbers are the way they are. However, I think it is interesting that they do have a lot of these in this category because they were considered anomalous and they weren't able to put them into any known uh, category. And in fact, they were saying that the region, uh, the sightings around the region vary in description. However, the shape and form most commonly being reported was the round orb or sphere shape. Now, I think it's interesting. Why are they putting these numbers out? Why are they putting this specific round orb and sphere shape out? Um, now, this is being reported by Fox. Okay, so this is definitely a, a news agency that is national. And so everyone will know this. Um, it's interesting because you and I have determined a lot of those round orb and sphere shapes to be mundane when we've looked at them ourselves between you and I. Um, now, maybe they are looking at some reports that are different and are anomalous because, you know, who knows? A hundred sightings of UFOs, round orb and sphere shapes along the eastern seaboard. Let's see how they report at the end of the year through Arrow. Will they just put push this aside or will they not even report on it and just consider it, um, you know, clutter well that's a good way to put it tim is it clutter is it live is it memorex <laughs> i don't know i really really don't know but you know what the one thing i do know tim is that it is that time of the night where we got to start wrapping things up and you know i know the fact that you love your sightings you love it this subject you're very passionate about it and that's why when it comes to the UFO report, there is no better than you, little Timmy Senor. Thanks, buddy. It's been Thank fun. You for making, thank you for making us sound good when you're here, man. I appreciate that. That means a lot. It's been fun. Thanks for having me. See you guys soon. Absolutely. And a big thank you also to Steve Stockton from Among the Missing for a great, great show tonight. And, of course, our guest, Jason Gilbert from the UAP Studies Podcast, coming on in and really lighten it up with some emotion tonight about Canadian UFOs. We got Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thal rocking in the background with Little Brother is watching. Bumblefoot is the official music of Spaced Out Radio, rocking us in and out of every single show. Get your horns up for the guitar god himself. Special thanks to everybody listening in at home, at work, in your cars, wherever you may be. Thank you to everyone in our chat rooms tonight. YouTube, Twitch, LGAP, Facebook, Spreaker, LinkedIn, the Space Travelers Club, and on Twitter at hashtag Spaced Out Radio. I know you're out there somewhere. Remember, this show is copyright by Spaced Out Radio and SOR Media Ventures Limited. Thank you so much for choosing to share your evening with us because together, my friends, we're watching. We own the night. Mr. Bumblefoot, we need a favor. We need you to take us home. Yes, the Wu train has docked for the night. But soon, my friends, we shall ride again. The sheets are always available. Your tickets never expire. And if you want to bring a friend, we've got room for them, too. Good night. Beauty. Beauty.
Beauty. Beauty. Beauty. Matthew Hale, paranormal investigator, investigator is our guest tomorrow night. Let me figure out what I'm supposed to do here. There we go. Big thank you tonight to Lord William times two, T-Bone, Simon, Lori, Mike, Darth, Debster, and my flock for the super chats. Very much appreciate the love. Yeah, way to carry the show tonight, RG. Appreciate that, man. Just absolute rock star performance. Rock star performance. Hey, Paramarv, how you doing? I'm tired. Very, very tired.
Cat Chaser jumping in on the super chat stuff here. Thank you, awesome Cat Chaser. Very much appreciate the love. I am in such slow motion right now. I don't want to be. Desiree, thank you. I don't want to be in slow motion tonight, though. You know what I'm doing after this? I am going to pour my do something that I haven't done in a long time. I'm going to pour myself a glass of milk. And I've got some really, really awesome chocolate chip cookies that I'm going to go dip in the milk and then eat them. That's what I'm doing right after this. Not good for the waistline, but one or two won't mind. That's right, Ben Eubanks. We don't have ugly swag. Oh, no. No. No, I don't. Infomax, how you doing? Tina Williams, how are you? I usually hate milk. I never drink milk. But damn it, to dip a good chocolate chip cookie in, I'll do it. I'll sacrifice my beliefs on that. I love love Pepsi too. I just can't drink it anymore. I had to cut my soda pop intake down a lot. I don't have any chocolate milk in the house right now. All right, guys, tomorrow night on the show, 
uh, Matthew Hale. We're getting into a lot of paranormal stories tomorrow night, which should be fun. And uh, thank you to our super chatters once again. Cat Chaser, Lord William times two, Mike T-Bone, Simon, Lori, Debster, My Flock, and Darth. Very much appreciate it. We'll see you all tomorrow night, guys. And don't forget, for five bucks a month, you can join the Space Travelers Club. The link is below in the show description. Can't wait to see you all tomorrow. And don't forget, it's also thought of the or Dave 101 night. We'll see you then. Healthy, my friend. You too. You need bail money. Give me a call. Always, Dad. Take care. <laughs> you too.